Right, this is going to be an episode of Snake and Banter. Obviously, it's after the major, and our guest for this one is Hugo, who was casting the major final. All I'm going to say is this, Hugo. That is cool. I'm sure it was very surreal. But also, you have come a long way since the days when we'd be at the Star Ladder event, and then it'd get to, like, Friday, and then you'd be like, right, guys, uh, headed off now. And I'd be like, where are you going? Like, you know, oh, I've got to catch my plane. I don't do the playoffs. That's pretty cool, mate. Now you do major finals. It's pretty dope. <laughs> Yeah, that happened a couple of times actually, where I'm like, uh, I'm I'm casting with Harry for the groups, and then he has the, he he upgrades his part oh. for the playoffs. So <laughs> I remember going home from China. I think that's the event you're talking about. So he could do playoffs with Halvor, and uh, yeah, that hurt a little bit, but you know, it it, it pushes you, Redunkin. It pushes you. Yeah, you need you need those L's. And also, mate, what people don't understand is one thing I'll give props to you and Harry and Launders and Scrawny is actually my advice was wrong. At the time, I had no idea what would happen to the other big duos, right? The joke is they all imploded and half of them don't even exist. And and two halves of one have made one that doesn't even do all the big patches. So like now at the time, you remember what it was like? There was those three duos and the perception was like, well, we can never get in the scene if they're there. That's why I told people, you should probably be an analyst or maybe do something else here. Or like it didn't seem at the time like you could ever get to the top, right? They had to do a major final be like right yeah, ironically, it feels almost more closed off now. Like, I, I think, <laughs> right. uh, I, I, yeah, it's crazy, right? But there's more opportunity, but to actually race through the ranks and go up, unless right. Harry and I, like, suddenly have, like, a fist fight in a bar, I think we're going to be okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and just don't, just don't meet up with config and drinks if he asks you, you know. That, don't that, yeah, a picture or two. I think also the value of just having a duo and, and actually liking each other goes yeah. a long way. It's going to you know, promote longevity, which is valuable, we could say, in this instance. Yes. A bit like, to be Are fair, you... Maui used to cast with Anders, and then he upgraded him to Henry G, so it's, just not, it's a cutthroat business. It's a cutthroat business, guys. <laughs> okay, okay. I, there's a lot. I, I'll... Go on. Actually, you know what? Should I just say it? Should yeah, I just say it? it? I mean, Please. I Always actually... Just okay, you know it. what? For That's the, my for career. The, for the blast... For the Blast Paris Major, actually, I was actually supposed to cast that with Anders, and then I actually, I turned it down. I turned oh, down okay. casting the Blast Paris Major. I said, okay. no, 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 just put me on the desk. I don't okay. want to cast this right now. I didn't think I was good enough then. I don't, okay. I, I don't really feel like I'm a, I just think like, you know, I, I'm definitely better than a lot of tier two casters, but I'm not really trying to be a caster. And that's why I was kind of like, yeah, there's that like bucket listing a lot of people have. It's like cast a pro cast a CSGO major and I could have checked that off my list but I was like that's not really what I came into the space to do and it's not really where I think my strongest skill set is and I'd rather have the Katie and you're not the main character moment than just just like laughing over an Anders clip you know yeah of course I mean I've always said even though I know why people want to be casters and why it's like a thrill and obviously you get like all oh, hours and hours people are wrapped with attention I have always said if you have the choice the reason I always would prefer analyst desk is there is no like break a baguette moment unless you get the best round of all time as a caster like there's no you could have a mega right you know, like, if anyone you don't even like on the outside that's kind of a I mean there's obviously one like you're shitting on even that's iconic man. that was like 30 <laughs> seconds from a match by the way none of us could even name the other long. none of us even know the other team in that match it was FlyQuest and I don't even know the other squad none of I us will ever know, know. but I'll yeah, tell no you idea. what that is more iconic than like some semi-finals I've heard casting because that's just esports right anyway that's enough industry talk obviously this is Snake and Banter and we do the whole three topics angle so like Fight Club the new person has to go first so Hugo what is your good point my good point for today is meritocracy is back in cs right not this <laughs> the year, timing's right? brilliant for what you've just said earlier but go on yeah keep going <laughs> <laughs> next year next year we're talking <laughs> all right oh, okay yeah sure sure the, the the death of partner leagues, Duncan. The death of partner leagues. I've been awaiting it. We've all been awaiting it. Post COVID or even COVID to post COVID era sure. has kind of gotten stale at times with the with the same teams, the same rosters, and especially when we look at the the organizations putting up frankly shit teams to tier one events. Look at EG. Look at NIP. I think some of these teams that have shown up at pro leagues, for example, and and just shown up to you know sure. do nothing, go O three consistently has has is boring and finally with the death of partner leagues with pgl announcing events star ladder announcing events uh we're finally going to have a more open circle we're going to have more tournaments and more importantly with no you know direct invites it's based off of presumably you know ranking now valve ranking which assuming they keep up with uh is is going to be a more skill-based scene i think i think we're going to have better teams rise to the top we're going to have uh more tournaments and overlapping tournaments which actually i do think is a good thing because it forces organ or tos to put on better events to attract players to their events so overall everyone kind of wins there there are more opportunities for 
a, a different level of teams to compete and also TOs had to put on better events, make players happier and uh, and as a result we're going to have a more competitive <laughs> scene for the for the whole for everyone really and and this doesn't even just apply to teams and players I think it applies to talent as well as we were talking about you know talent coming up I think there's going to be more opportunity for you know people on the desk new casters duos all roles in talent to, to come through and, and work these different events because it's it's difficult even with this schedule to attend every single event for teams and for talent but I think it'll be impossible to do every event next year so you know, it might be fairly closed off now for everyone involved, but I think it's only going to be opening up, and that's a good thing. I'm a fan of the open circuit, the fact that the level of competition will have to rise because teams, it's basically saying that teams that are in form are the ones that are going to be rewarded. And I will say that I would rather watch a 15th ranked team in the world play instead of some moribund evil geniuses nip roster that really has no business even being in some of the s tier lands that they had participated in however i will say that i expect this to hurt casual viewership and it's not that i feel like my audience are the casuals out there but thinking about the people that bring the big numbers when we think of the biggest games of the blast paris major the biggest game of and most viewed game of the blast paris major for was was phase navi in the group stage mm -hmm. the sec the, the biggest was the grand finals but it's the big orgs that be bring big viewership which in turn will bring a bit more ad revenue and then in turn like eyeballs just all of that goes a long way when you get phase navi g2 uh the best brazilian team like furia all of those teams playing against each other and i just have to think for example uh if, if we didn't have say because because for for one thing i think that it's there, there's been these just kind of moments and in time where like g2 is going through a roster change or like navi's going through a roster change and maybe they aren't actually at that very moment a top eight team but they still get the invite and i feel like missing out on that viewership is going to have some maybe just short-term repercussions and hopefully the teams are going to just figure things out a lot faster uh i will say like 80% of this, I'm a fan of, though. I, I am a fan of the fact that we don't have to just watch bad partner teams play over and over again, because that was always kind of the worst part of the day, especially when you're tasked with working those games where it's like, oh, shit, we're covering NIP EG for the final spot. Who's going to come in second to last place in ESL Pro League? It was just my least favorite thing at all, because there's no way to get around that. And what was annoying about it is that behind the scenes, those orgs would then complain about you as talent saying, why are they shitting on our teams? When it's like, what are you putting forward to have me say anything positive about your team? So I would rather that those those kinds of orgs be gone who are just living off of the fact that they're a partner team that they paid for a slot as opposed to putting an actually good team forward. You you deserve to be gone. Like I don't, you don't deserve to be here in any capacity other than you paid one time a one-time fee. I would yeah. say, oh, go on, go on, come on. I, I was just gonna say on the note yeah, of like viewership and, and as a result getting less money and less eyeballs, while that's while that's valid, I also think that you know more money will go in because you'll have a bigger depth of teams, and so you have more incentive for a larger amount of orgs to invest because there are more spots at tournaments because there are overlapping tournaments. So it's like it's a yin and yang. There's a there's a give and a take, but I think you'll have yeah less viewership maybe, but also a wider variety of investments. The thing is, it'll only be per stream, it will be less viewers. And actually, you'll have obviously net more viewership. In fact, this could be the move that takes CS2, the game, closer to the League of Legends of the world, where obviously they have that insane Chinese viewership to pump in a few million every time. So I'd also say as well, in the modern day, one of the big things I bemoan is that right now, it's not even about like the sponsor on your jersey and that sort of jazz. Like that's not that's not really what the people are paying for. Like they actually care more about things, by the way, like social campaigns and getting someone to a website or use a code or something like that. They or brand awareness. The raw viewership from being on a stream, it isn't really making anyone buy a product. So I would say like in the modern day it's just about qualifying to the major. You get your millions that way, don't you? So I think in some ways like the what's basically happened is the economics have just been reassigned within the scene. I actually think this is basically a good move for everyone. But at the end I'll get to the people it isn't because just always like to dunk on people, don't offer things who are wrong about so for teams it's better 
almost objectively, because the best thing is actually, no matter who you are, even if you're actually some of the best teams, this now provides you with a safety net that we didn't have since the post-COVID world, which was, because there would be a tournament like every one month to 1.5 months. If you go to one and you have a bad day and you fuck up, like especially those old ones that start with a B or one, and then you just, pl- by the way, the nightmare scenario at the ESL events before they changed now to the B or three is the first one that kind of eats it, was you get bounced in the B or one by like a challenge team and then another top team does you play each other in the low bracket one of you comes last place and then you have to go home and wait a month and a half to show that you're not shit and that was just like three maps so I've always thought that was kind of whack like if I think of teams right now there's three massive names that were at the majors you have Team Liquid you have Astralis and you have Falcons Right, guys, two of those teams have already made roster moves because it's going to be so long till their events and they were just sitting at home. If there'd have been some sort of cheeky, like extra, like a dream hack or something, the equivalent of that, Starlad is an obvious one, where they could have gone and beaten like the other teams that are like, you know, ninth to whatever. That would have been a way to show, hey, there is something still going on here. Though. Like Team Lucas roster does work. You don't have to make a change. You know, hey, Falcons, maybe Boris, that was just a bad event. You know, they bounce back with him. Like, instead, at the moment, I actually think the circuit before was making people take huge gambles and then just throw the money down the drain and not even give it a chance to grow. Whereas like you look at some of the other lineups, it's not like every lineup wins right out the gate. So I actually thought that was kind of whack. And then I also think the part people missed, which was great about the old system, is when you're on a heater, when you're the number one team, you can just attend all the events and boom, if you are the best, that is the era. Like, I went back, and if people don't know, I actually did a video where I went back and retroactively gave Faze an era in 2022. Because what people forgot is this. Bro, there's like a third as many events. So if you look at the actual number of events they have... That is like equivalent if you scale it up to like what you would have done if you were Fnatic. You win like, you know, 12 events, like a couple of ma- majors, like there's this part it. But the point is people like Fnatic could win 12 events because they could lose nine events in the same year. People like FaZe probably played like, I think they played something like 14 lands in the whole year. I just said Fnatic won 12 in a year and then lost a load. And by the way, didn't win all three majors that year. So like, the, I actually think the opportunity for teams, because I like, what I love about the open circuit, it's like tennis. You can have a bad tournament, but you can be right back the next week and you can back it back at the next Grand Slam. Nothing's like permanent. It's not like League of Legends where you build up and if you fuck it at Worlds, you would just shit that whole year. And the next year, by the way, you might even be in a team. So for teams, I think it's great. For talent, for people like us, it's amazing. Because inarguably... You can't be in two places at one time, so definitely it will mean more people are getting hired. Like, it also means, actually, that discussion we were having earlier, that closed off nature, that should be gone now. In fact, one thing I'm really looking forward to is, I have done through shows, and when I used to work on events, I've brought so many talent through that were just people online who had YouTube channels. Those people might be able to work events now, and what you don't know is, that's people like Maui Snake. That's people like Alan Hender, like some of these people have gotten onto the big events. They come from that. By the way, if you don't know, Freya began just doing like fan interviews of like people at Face It. Like that's it. She was just a, just a girl online. She did a tweet like I'd done an interview or whatever. We saw it, like a few people retweeted it. Like if you if if she'd have actually had to go and grind like tier three online cops in China, she ne- you'd never have heard of her. Like you'd never be able to get to that gig because not least because in her role there is no host tier three land. Like it's just two casters in it. So I actually think you will have so many more talents come through, and you'll see who's actually the best now. You won't just have these and ones. Well, this, 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 Maybe someone comes to Star Ledger and they just kill it and they're like the rookie of the year or something. That's dope. Then in terms of formats, this is one thing I'm really excited for because I love, if you remember, Star Ledger are the ones that always did Swiss System. They used to do Swiss System best of three. Well, I'll tell you what, you might not think it's the biggest event one, but if they have good teams there, you're going to get to see everything those teams are about. You're going to get some amazing fucking matches. The amount of sample size, that's another reason, by the way, if you're a team on the rocks, go to that event. You'll get like five best of threes to see if you're any good. Like that's a pretty good chance to turn the ship around. And also that means you can have double at some tournaments, Swiss at the other ones, you see who does well in which ones. And then lastly, here's the dog. Remember when y'all, for years, everyone to a man, I mean, bloody hell, even the casters used to do, and I used to go, are you mental? You're actually sawing out the branch you're sitting on, my friends. Even casters used to complain, oh, burn out, I'm traveling like 300 years, days a year. You don't think about that, though, when that offer comes in in that email, though, do you? You don't go, hey, do you know what? I've had enough events, bit burned out myself. You, you can hit up Alan. Alan will do that. No, you all say yes because you want the money, you rat. Well, first of all, you literally get paid per day. So if you're arguing for fewer days in the year and you're getting the same money, you're a cunt. And if you're not getting that, you're an idiot. What are you doing? You can just choose not to attend, you know. I've done it a million times. I've turned down fucking DreamHack Masters. I've turned down IEMs. I've turned down E-League. Bitch, I've turned down majors. So sit on that. So all I'll say, 
years, the grass wasn't greener. There's even like an actual thing I've joked to him. I always think about it. I've actually looked at I think there is actually supposed to be. It's not just even a meme, apparently. There actually is like some like optical phenomenon where it's to do with like how far grass is from you and the light on the day. That literally grass in the other field does look greener to you than the ones you're on. And that if you go there, obviously you'd look back and the same effect would happen. You go, oh, shit, the, the grass was over there. It was a bit, oh, I should have gone back. So my point is, I never understood people complaining because I'm not a noob just in CS. I was following League of Legends the whole time. League of Legends is like what we had in 2022, but half as many events. It's a nightmare, mate. Like you have like a small sample size. By the way, imagine how many people get to work in that game. It's, it's way less than CS. It's a bigger game. Like it's a nightmare to be in a scene like that. You don't want it. You want this open scene because then like you were saying at the beginning, meritocracy will win. Like, at the end of the day, if someone comes, like I say, and a team comes and kills it at Starladder, they're going to get the invite to Cologne. If a team of talent goes to Starladder and they're the best, mate, eventually, everyone on Reddit's going to be like, why aren't they hiring this person? And they're going to get the gig. They're going to get a blast shot. They're going to get, like, a cheeky invite to the planes of Canavita. They're going to get that shot, but they're going to do it all on their own back. You don't have to do it on some fake hype. It's right. I think across the board, it's good for everyone. I know why people used to complain, but I also think everyone's had a few years off now. Aren't we all ready to go back to work? That's one thing I'll just say in this industry. Everyone come up, burned out. Mate, get back to me. I've done 20 years of this shit. I'm not burned out. Just maybe fucking manage your time. Get off the screen for four hours before you go to bed, you moron. Have some glycine. Have a fucking glass of water. Read a book. I know, crazy <laughs> idea. Like budget in your time. And instead of watching... 175 straight YouTube shorts as a dopamine thing. Tick, 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 tick. As China just feeds info in your brain. I don't know. Maybe just schedule in like a classic movie for two hours and she'll go, oh, it's brilliant. Barry Lyndon. Never knew that was a fucking classic in its own way. Every scene's like a masterpiece, isn't it? Like, maybe just do that. You know, start enjoying your life instead of just going, oh, i burned out from watching video games. I think I've got the solution, mate. Take it. Shout out to fucking Tyler, the creator. Stop fucking looking at the screen, you daft cunt. Get off the video games. You're making it sound like you're blank and you're distracted and they make it. You're watching all like, there's a choice. You can walk away. You can just walk away from the piece. See, so there we go. <laughs> That's my. That was almost like my point there. I, I told you to say that point. No, 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 that, that was great. I had one more, one more go thing on, on that do as it. well. By the way, you, you don't, really... you don't have to be polite. It's just a talk show. Jump in, mate. Okay, great. It, 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 you know, you mentioned like uh, rosters. You also mentioned the major. I also think this is something that it, next year is going to be a lot better because the rumors are RMR is like dead now, and if that, well. You know, talking about the calendar alone, it feels like it's got to be dead, right? This, where's the room for it? But let's presume it is. And uh, and I think this word will probably come up a lot later. Using the word fluke for an RMR, we often see like one team come through. Yeah. You know, back even when the miners were a thing, one team would come through a regional event. They make a run. They get to the major. They get the stick of money like that. It's exciting, but also it's probably gone because if we get rid of the RMRs. Invites for the major, I presume, will be based on Valve ranking. That's based on, again, consistency across multiple events. So we're going to have, in theory, better teams at the major as well. All I'm going to say is this. I'll tell you who actually opened that, like, cork and counter episode and was listening. And then when they dropped those spicy bombs, like, about that, no RMRs, I'll guarantee the people in Guild Eagles were just like, because uh, it's like, bro, you'll never be at an event. You just forget about majors. It's over for you. Like, you actually have to do things for real now. You can't just go to a major and go, ha, no one even knows us because we're nobody. We beat FaZe! Yay! Like, that's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> you have to actually beat FaZe for real. Then you get to the RMR. So, but good at least luck with you'll that. Be on land. At least yeah, you'll, on land, you'll, here's the thing. You will have more lands to play, though. So, if you actually are good, by the way, you'll go to that star ladder and you'll show us. And then maybe then we actually fucking hype you. Because that's the other thing, to be fair. The other thing that was a nightmare is if you're below about 15th in the world, you're in that like nightmare lottery of online qualifiers that is like that's just nightmare fuel I can tell you like there are so many good land teams will just have fucked those up and not made it and then you've got nothing to do for two months right let's move on Maui what is your good point mine is that we're starting to see I guess it's kind of uh I'm just looking at the teams that are in the playoffs practically but I would say that there's a case for longevity with rosters and this is kind of a uh it's me looking at teams like Navi, teams like Eternal Fire, teams like Cloud9, and there's not a huge, huge difference. Like, I'm not going to go out and say, like, oh, it's because they were together for years and years and years. It's because they had something and started with something strong, but they stayed together as a roster maybe longer than some other people would have wanted. So what I'm trying to get at here is that 
of all the teams that were in the playoffs, not Navi was actually the longest standing five man roster moving into that. So for them to win the event is actually pretty cool to see that. Yeah, it does actually take some time. I will say that I'm usually one of the first people to jump on a team after three months if things are not working at all. And I will say, okay, there's time for roster moves. We need to see a swap in this team. It's not working because I think you need to hit a baseline level. The thing is that Navi hit that baseline level. I mean, when they were playing as the four man unit with simple, they, they obviously or they um they made it to the grand finals of ESL Pro League losing out to Mao's in the end of CS:GO uh in terms of some of their placements at at some of the blast events they were actually pretty strong there too I, so so there was something to work with like we're not going to just I'm not going to just say yeah give this team a year if they're not even getting top 8 at any of events like it's you, you do want to see some results first but I want to just kind of even cite some of the other teams because I think that some of the teams that we would say had the worst firepower in the top 8 were still able to accomplish that because of the longevity of the roster and the fact that they had good teamwork this the team with the longest standing roster going into that top eight was eternal fire and you look at that roster and you would probably like i think people were pretty 50 50 on if they were even going to make the playoffs of the major but the thing is that because they played with each other for a while because they were very comfortable on a couple maps they knew what they're what they were all about and so that that helps them so tremendously because i would say that like, for example, Heroic's a team that was a little bit newer. Like, like I would say, on paper, Heroic has more firepower than an Eternal Fire, but they didn't perform as well at the Major. And I would say that's probably due in part to the fact that they were still putting pieces together. The, the first things they ever played together were the open qualifiers for the Major. It was almost a miracle they made it through all of those unscathed and made it this far into the Major. But I just think that when it comes down to some of these teams and some of the, the way that <laughs> roster construction is done, I would say that if you know that there is a baseline decent product, it doesn't hurt you to just stay stay the course for a while as long as there's no kind of interpersonal issues. Come on, Hugo, jump in. I've, I've not got a huge takeaway for that. Oh, yeah, I, uh, like I mostly agree. Are, are you arguing the, to to keep four or five rosters, Maui, in general, or are you just talking about cores? He just wants to have a longer that... time, like let them blossom. Is what he's sort of arguing. It's it's a it's that I guess. It's kind of, I'm writing, I'm, so before, I feel like I'm just one of the hotter take people about like, oh, this shit's not working, blow it up, like, for Liquid or something like that. But yeah. I know that the product is just inherent, it's so flawed from the first few outings. But when it comes to having a team that, you know, is like, maybe top 15 caliber, and they they show that immediately, well, okay, it actually... It actually makes sense to stay together for maybe even longer than the three months that we had before, like five months, six months, which is what Eternal Fire did, which is what Navi did. Yeah, and I think even going back to what we were talking about, uh, back on my point, in relation to that, like next year, I think that's only going to increase, right, in theory, because you'll have more events. You can, you can, you know, bomb out one event, but as long as you stay consistent across the season, uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to, like, completely change roster off or even drop players after one bad performance because you're straight into the next line, you're straight into the next line that, like, never really stops. And uh, and even, even with roster locks for uh, the major, going back to RMR point, I think... Yeah, they, we'll probably continue to see longer standing rosters. Right, here's what's crazy is this is actually a classic point I've had on my shows for years. But the problem is when you can say a point a million times, you forget where you said it. And so I actually did promise to do a video that I did last year, finally, about this concept where my original theory, true, it was back in the old circuit, we had more lands, was that it takes three to four months for you to know who a team is because you have to have the chance to fail once and to do well once as a fluke and, you know, the middling land. And then you get the players get to have a chance to go up and down because obviously everyone doesn't have the same identical rating across everything event and my point was you don't like overreact on the first month but at the same time once it gets to like I used to say three to four months was my window I would say then after that because you know who they are now if they like you know they're stuck at fifth to eighth you don't keep it going nine months like it's very rare ever a team turns it around one of the few examples ever was the mouse sports with Carrigan and Rops and by the way that's because they fundamentally changed a role within the team so essentially it's almost like changing a player at that point in time so I actually looked this up when Maui was talking and of the eight teams in the playoffs here's what six of them how long since they made their last roster move phase is three to four months vitality is a about four months. Uh, Mouse is about three to four months. Navi is about four months. G2, four months. Cloud9, four months, right? These teams, are basically, that's... It, it plays to what Maui's saying. These teams had time to cook. They had time to develop. By the way, they all, in their own way... Not really fears, but they all had slight failures here and there. I mean, even Vitality fucked up Canavita, you know what I mean? They all had their ups and downs, but it meant that when you got to the major, 
you get a sense like you actually got to see what these teams are capable of. They're good. Like they could. Put, by the way, another great thing about that period of time is you've been through the hard times too. So when your back's against the wall, it's not like, oh shit, fuck, is this lineup it's not working? Oh, you've already had a good result. You've had a couple of lands. So I actually think it just bears out that what I was saying and perform that concept because I do think the other thing we're going to throw in as well now is. It's one thing if it's 2012 and you just have a five-man roster made by players. And by the way, where there's no buyouts and essentially any star player can just go to a lesser team in his country and say, hey, give us your best player. You can always change. Yeah, in that era, maybe you can be cynical. In the modern day, there are players you've never heard of who cost $300,000 buyout. Like, you can't buy that player, then go, hey, shit, after two and a half lands, and then go, right, throw him in the bin. Like, and then everyone later on go, the fan who wanted that change, then go, why are all these stupid esports teams losing? money it's like bro you're the fucking idiot that doesn't even let them play a whole premier league season like you fire the sign in after week one and then you make them sign another one and then by the way if like an nip they don't sign a mega player god forbid they're fucking idiots like they must just not know anything about the game no they just don't have a money tree in the backyard do they? they can just go and pick it off like they've got fucking investor money and by the way you tell you the worst thing about that is you have to go and explain to your investors why you signed this guy for like 500k and he's shit and you're replacing him like they don't like that and then even worse think about this they're gonna go well good news is though like we bought him for 500k we got the contract for two years so sell him for like I don't know 250k and you're like, oh sorry he's uh, tanked his whole stock and uh, nobody will buy him it's like brilliant well I'll definitely put 2 million more into your org for next year this sounds like a brilliant fucking affair that I'm doing here. Oh, and we're not getting the results as well. <laughs> brilliant. I think I'll just go and play. I'll, I'll just invest in Valorant. It makes more sense. Like, I, I know those teams are partnered already. So, I do think it's actually a good premise. Like, the obvious one, we could potentially get to this later, is obviously Na'Vi. Like, Na'Vi was the one, I've always said this, you can go back in history, when Blade initially brought Bit into the lineup of Na'Vi, he famously said something mad like, it's going to take six months to make this project work. Then if you remember, around the time, I think maybe you got SD, I think he said something similar, like, give me, like, whatever amount of months. And everyone laughed at him, like, ha, 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 stupid Blade. And it's like, mate, he's one of the people who's, like, downloading an entire philosophy of CS into the brain of the player. He's not going, like, fuck around and play how you want and I'll sort of work around you. No, no, he's the professor. He's, like, going, you're going to the degree course when you go to Blade's team. You're not going to get that in a week. You can you can join Face Clan and fuck around and win some games. They they play a bit of a loosey goosey style and they'll accommodate you early on. They'll even like give up a role or something. If you want to be, if you want to have teams like Navi where they don't just have the most cracked players, but they could win an event, you have to give coaches time to work. I think this is what you see with some of those big teams when they make the roster move too quickly. It's like if you've got Gobby, give him time, mate. Give him like three months to work on this. Don't just make the player change immediately because the first land went bad. So essentially, I do agree with this premise. Like I think actually. Both financially, I think it's even worse now. And I also think the in-game product is way worse when you chop and change because this isn't the old days where no one had a coach and everyone was just fucking around between events. Like the other teams, like Fears of Vitality and Spirit, they're going to keep their level. So if you're just fucking around constantly, you might also, even if it's a better player, be going back to square one every time. You're just resetting your four months over and over and over and over again. And basically, that's the one thing I would say about the lineups I just referenced who didn't make the major. Not as they're nearly all brand new fucking lineups that have no experience and they just got to play like a blast group stage or something or, or an online qualifier or a bullshit RMR like that's your running to the major like even if you qualified you were going to win the major after like half an event it just is implausible in the modern day so I do think actually teams have to be less cynical in that regard they have to actually say this if I sign this player I have to believe like I give him a chance because Matt what I would say is this if you want to cut people, I'll flip it on the other side and I'll put the spotlight back on the org. If you keep cutting players that are big signings, you know you should cut next? The general manager. He's fucking mismanaging the funds and the team, you idiot. He's going, sign this guy, I really believe in him after a, a, a land and a half. Nah, he's no good. Well, then you had no fucking eye and he obviously didn't believe in him because he gave him one and a half lands. So I think this is actually, this actually, hopefully, this major playoffs, if as Maui says, people have taken note, might actually make some of the other teams realise that you've got to build you know, you're going to actually have time to get good. You're going to give people a chance to flourish. Maybe they even come from, like, a Broland's a great example, right? When he first came in the house, yeah, he was all right. Dude, you give him time. He's, like, back to Broland. Like, these are the players where they'd maybe be tossed out if you thought you could get some hot FPL talent tomorrow. But he won't be Broland. So, okay. Anything else? Yeah, I think it's also impressive that we've got longer standing rosters when you consider that the scene is so international right now as sure. well, right? Like, it's... Oh, it's a limited, sure. Yeah, if you are limited just to your country, I think, you know... 
you're, it's going to limit your options as a, as a fact. But everyone's speaking English now. Most of the top teams are speaking English. So there's a, a wider pool. But also on that general manager point, I think coaches have only gotten better at actually scouting players. When we see players get picked up, sure, people have to learn new roles and new spots. But you often, like back in the day, you would see players get picked up off of stats or off of a, an FPL run or off of a run in the tournament. And uh, often it would be GMs picking people up. But now you get coaches like Saw, like Blade, people who will actually go and look at the demos. And, and when you see like a young pug star picked up, often uh, the, the coach will say like, yeah, we looked at his demos. We figured out his spots. We saw that he had an eye for the game. It's not just based off of numbers or, or, or a good tournament or a run through, you know, FPL or something like that. It's actually based on, you know, watching them play and, and, and seeing their performance and seeing their position. So I think that's, yeah, better as well. Right. Let's move on then. So the bad point, what is your bad point, Hugo? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You okay. your good point. Oh, wait, you're right, actually. I didn't. Oh, yeah. Wait, that's yeah. true. Uh, you just made such good points that I thought I'd made <laughs> a point for once. You know, whatever. That's not even true, but whatever. Mike. Well, be part, the part where I thought it was that you, you made good points. Not what I would say is, okay, actually, this is mad. I can't believe I missed this one. Here's the weirdest angle ever on Alexi B winning the major. Believe it or not, I don't even have like the relief of like finally he won or like, mm, yeah, now he's like, believe it or not, I actually think the best part is because morons really do only care about trophies and no matter how much they hate in their brain, if you win the big major, you must be really good. This actually gives a complete reset to the narrative of Alexi B's career because he had the stupidest momentum of all time where they really did think he should have won tournaments with those rosters. Like, the only one that's even vaguely there for me is the G2 one. And even then, it was Jax instead of GKS, as I will point out one million fucking times. So I actually think the cool thing now, if you're Alexi B, is not only do you have an insane trophy on your resume and or more importantly you didn't do it with simple so they can't even say that by the way if you don't it was simple then they go well, yeah, simple. nobody's going well you had wonderful well you had gl in fact if anything they're like wow those players are better than i thought they were before like actually i'd say that's helping alexi b's case so the good thing now is that whole narrative is dead now from now on he's just a, a guy who has a real chance to be a top igl and ups and downs i think the difference is when the next navi failure happens people will ask for a player to be fired, but it won't be Alexi B. They won't say, just replace him and get in certain kicks on or something. They'll, now Alexi B has a chance to actually, like, he's essentially thrown the baggage out of the window of the plane as he boarded the private jet that's for major winners only, that flushes in there with a the cockpit, in the, with a pilot, like, do, cheating on his taxes or what, whatever he might be doing, allegedly, in a, in a video game. Right? What do you guys think? The, the first you, thing I have to bring up is that in the Sun Gods rap that was made for ESL Pro League in 2022 to diss the Night Shift, which was me, Paula, and uh, Bleh, uh, Sponge said that Mau he was in jest. He said, Maui's got takes as clean as Alexi B's trademark fakes, which was a tongue-in-cheek comment saying, remarking upon the fact that he didn't really think Alexi B's fakes were all that, nor did he think my takes were all that. Well, how did that age, dickhead? <laughs> I'm just going to say as well, even though it's slightly mean, because he's not doing it from a pro play. Chad, you were a pro IGL, mate. All I'm going to say is this, my dude. Like, Alexi B's worst game, you'd, you'd actually be talking about that like it was versus Titan or Mirage at Claude 2015 if you had his worst game. So, just going to say that, you know. Going to say that. So, anyway, what do you think, Hugo? Yeah, I mean, Alexi... I can't believe that was your only point. You just this chat, and that's it. There's no point. <laughs> what, you know, we'll, we'll come back to you afterwards. Give us your take, Hugo, and then he'll think of a real take, not just this yeah. chat. Um, on on a on Alexi, I mean, he wasted two he he wasted two years in OG. Like he wasted two years in in a team that never put together a roster that was even capable of, of getting playoffs at big events, let alone like being in the conversation for winning a major. So I'm not surprised his his stock maybe was was fairly low. But talking about G2, like the the. He didn't have long. He didn't even have a year in G2 either. And they still made some finals. They still made some, made some top four runs at a yep. blast event. Um, and and it was it was probably you know butchering the major that that got him cut in the first place at Antwerp. And then G2 cut him. They bring in Puxi and or. or was it Nexa after that? And they just do the same thing at Rio anyway. They, they in fact, go worse. They don't even yes. get to the RMR. So, yeah, his, his stock was always going to be low, but I actually think it's nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It's nice that he's actually got a chance to... Because you frame it of like, oh, he, he, he didn't do this with Simple. Uh, well, my response to that is 
would be he did it with Ema, who has looked like nothing like his Paris run ever since, even yeah. in this tournament, was pretty underwhelming. And I don't just mean off numbers. Like when you see him in like some of the positions he gets on some T sides, some of the lurks, I feel like there are so many players that could get more value out of that. And sure, he's coming out in interviews and saying like, oh, if, we're, if I'm bottom of the scoreboard and we're winning, it doesn't really matter. It's like, yeah, logically, I, I agree. But also, they're, they're, I think even after Navi are winning, there is that little, uh, you know, parasite in the back of your mind like as soon as they start losing you know simple as there maybe the rifle for Ema or, or there are plenty of other players I think you could play his role and have proven themselves to play his role at a at a higher level so I'm glad that he's not going to be the first one on the chopping block for once because as Launders would say his time in NIP doesn't count and <laughs> two two years wasted in OG and a G2 that clearly didn't believe in him if they're cutting him after one botched major while well, everyone botches majors nowadays uh, I think it's nice that he's got some security behind his position because I I think this team is cool like you you know not everyone's not everyone's behind the the, the Na'Vi run and, and we were talking about the win percentage of rounds and, and whether or not this is a fluke but I I think the the roster is cool and there are pieces of it to like and I've also always liked Alexi B's T sides even his track record what is it now it's got to be like like almost 20 and 2 um, against his former teams like that's actually fucking insane yeah. if you think about it there's no one with that kind of repertoire to, to consistently beat their former teams I don't even know at that point what you're, what you're taking away or what he's saying or whether that's a fluke but that's a statistical anomaly that he's beating his former rosters so consistently even G2 in in, uh, in Copenhagen for for a real take I just feel like it's it's just such a self-own when people are express that they the only way that they can value an in-game leader is by trophies because obviously if you were to do that then you would just give I mean Hooksy won Katowice and Cologne so you should rate him as one of the highest the best in-game leaders in the world right there it's uh, it's just reductive and that's why you need to watch the game, and that's why stats don't still tell the whole picture, because even a stat like T-side round win percentage, which I do cite frequently, doesn't always tell this, the whole story, because sometimes the reason that, say, G2 has a good round win percentage on T-side is because we saw Nico have a masterclass by himself. And so there's these, there's just, there's been an aspect to Alexi's game, which... For people that have watched closely for a very long time have recognized there's a strong mid-round understanding, especially when he was calling with Ents, especially when he's calling with OG, that lifted the pieces that he was working with well above the sum of their parts. And for, for him to finally gain that trophy, it's going to make the reductive and easy conversation a lot easier for why you can include him in the best in-game leaders in the world but anybody that was watching closely should have been on top of this and i think some people might even go like okay well who are other in-game leaders that where the eye test just really checks out well like i mean that doesn't that don't necessarily have the trophies i mean shuhei's a prime example the difference between how he was calling with Mao's versus how dexter was calling with Mao's is a stark difference there's there's other people like this that were propping up before they actually get the cabinet because we're actually watching closely and not just using result oriented analysts analysis I'll give you a couple of little facts as well for people who like to talk shicks. Another thing they also do is if they look at a lineup, their brain is incapable of doing what I do, where I try to remember the time period and how what was that player experience? Was he good at the time? They just take the player's name and he's static. He's always that good and he always was going to be that good. So there's two players that he played with that are at the top of the game right now. Remember, he played with Flames from Vitality. Spoiler, he was 17 years old and never been to any lands. So, brilliant. Then he had Monacy, didn't he? You know, no, Monacy, 16-year-old rookie Monacy, his first ever lands, right? You're supposed to just win the tournament with these people. You're supposed to actually win the major with, like, rookie Monacy. By the way, Huxley didn't, even final. Huxley didn't even qualify to a fucking major with when he had his first shot with better Monacy, as he's had, like, nine months at that point in time. So, I also think people are just very, very unfair in that regard. So, okay, then we go to the bad point for... Hugo, yes, they actually are the bad point now. So what is your bad point? Come on. I might get some resistance, but uh, I don't care. I've been saying Come it for on. years. I've been thinking it for years, and, and uh, it's nice to finally get the platform to put this in long form and, and have a debate. Inferno is 
it, it's solved. It's done. The map's completed. It's boring to watch. It's 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 over for me. It's been over since 2020. Ever since the Astralis era, era ended, it's gotten progressively worse every single year to watch. I think VP. Uh, I love how VP play. I think they're the culprit for this. They they you know really push this percentage play of of stacking random bomb sites of saving in even post plants. And now everyone has realized, like, okay, this is the way to play the map. This map has gotten worse and worse and worse every single year. And you know it's not it's not 2014 anymore. Freiburg isn't the king of banana. You can't even really fight for banana on T sides. CS2 has in fact made this map worse. And it's not just the remake that's like uninspiring. It's the open skyboxes, which as a general concept I approve of, but really push this map to uh, map to its limits in how much it limits the T sides. You're getting blocked out of mid. You're getting blocked out of ramp, out of spawn on T sides because CTs have those insta lineup smokes. Banana one Molotov spreads to both sides. That would that took two mollies back in CS:GO. It's it's tiny choke points. It's narrow. It's ugly. It plays bad. And and going back to the the stacking style as well, like. It doesn't matter if you set up your round perfectly on T sides and you play down to the final 30 seconds. At the end of the day, how many rounds do you see CTs will just draw, you know, cycle smokes a B and just make the gamble and you're walking blind into a bomb site? I'm even thinking about that final, the phase Navi final, where it, they were like, phase was 7 0 down on T side. They couldn't do anything. The only way they started winning rounds, they broke in with like two, three rounds at the end of the half. The only way they won those rounds was by running through the banana smoke halfway through its its lifespan because they realized like if we if we wait, we're gonna we're gonna get gambled. Like we we can't play this mind game of oh they're throwing three smokes over here oh, is this a, is the stack on the other side or is it one player dropping smokes and i think all these like changes for cs not just the dropping nades but also the open sky boxes all these cs2 things are good but they're, they're pushed to the limits on inferno and it actually just makes this map boring to play at tier one vertigo is more entertaining to watch right now at tier one cs than inferno and it's been that way for years it's the way he waited till the end to drop the hottest mm. take of all. Yeah, right on the know, end. I know, like, yeah. just as a freebie, yeah. like a side of wings coming. Like, fuck it all, all right. So, go on then. <laughs> go on, Maui, go on. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll save that last part right. for later. I'll save that last part for later. Don't get triggered. I, don't, I, let, don't let him bait you with the last part. Just answer the first part. I, exactly. I, I do think that Inferno and Vertigo have been my two least favorite maps in Tier 1 CS for some time now. I'll, I'll give it that. Sure. Whether, I'll, I'll, again, I'll keep saving that Vertigo thing because I don't think I've come along to that one yet. I think Vertigo is still the worst for me. But for Inferno overall, I think that the list of problems are pretty, pretty well known at this point. Everything kind of just feels feels like a hallway because and everything is so confined that it's almost too neat how every smoke mall or molly for every position is so effective because you think of think of some maps like uh, mid on mirage you can't really just block that with a single smoke there's so much space there that there's ways to fight around it like you can't just shut a whole position like the most vile spot of the map requires multiple sets of utility for it to actually be shut down but the most vital spot of inferno is banana and so it's just this crazy utility dump at the beginning of rounds that ends up with usually the t's coming out on top because they'll usually just end up you could kind of just smoke your way up because you can just smoke their mollies you sit behind them you can just spam through the smokes and i think that one thing that people don't like about the map and i don't like about the map is that the the likelihood of saving uh, if you don't actually get the bomb site is so repetitive and boring that I feel like the pro natural progression of an infernal round in tier one counter strike goes as follows you there's a triple man CT fight for banana they end up slowly losing banana and then what they end up doing is they have one person B and four per people a but because they expended so much utility on that initial banana fight they don't actually have the necessary utility to retake B when the T's eventually just go B and one of the worst things that ever happened in last year's counter-strike was when G2 in air quotes, solved uh, solved Inferno because all you do is you slowly encroach on B on Banana, you exec because you will end up with more utility at the end of that engagement than the CTs will have, and your utility is cheaper than the utility that the CTs have, and so you're just going to exec into their bomb site with cheaper utility, better guns that are cheaper, and you just keep hammering it over and over and over again, and you end up going A just a couple of times there just because you want to keep the defense a little bit honest, and if you don't keep them honest, well then they will start three stacking B, but three Restacking B isn't even that scary because if they're playing emo, if they're playing new box and they're playing boost, you can now smoke off the boost. You can eat, you can molly emo, you can molly new box, and then use three pieces of utility, which basically covered all the best spots for CTs to play. It's, it's so annoying to even watch that. 
I'm glad you're bringing it up on the show because I don't think we've actually had this kind of lengthier discussion about it. It's not it's not worse than Vertigo, though. It's not worse than Vertigo. No, it's yeah. not... In Vertigo, yeah. it, it, on, on Inferno, this happens on no other map. On Inferno, you can get two kills. If, if, if the CTs make a mistake and you get two kills on an entry, you've just won the round. You've just, you've, it's over. The round is done. That doesn't happen on any other map, any other site, anywhere. You can, you can win retakes from man downs in Vertigo. You can't do that on Inferno. It's so constricting. It's so limiting. Util is so much more important. How often do you actually see a CT on an Inferno bomb site get a multi kill? Like getting two kills is like, wow, you've just, you've mm -hmm. destroyed. Maybe in pit okay maybe in pit you've got a guy baiting site you might get two kills but you can you can get multi kills in every position in vertigo you you can't do it on inferno inferno b site inferno is the one bomb site in the entire game where there is a single entrance into the site it is that yes. constricting you know, you're talking about the choke points and don't go and tell me oh but you can wrap arch and you can come through ct <laughs> like that's full cope it's it's the only site where there's one entrance in the entire game it it needs to go we need to bring in train or i'm not even i'm not even going to die on a hill of what map we need to bring in and i will say you know i threw in the vertigo one as a bit of spice it is the second worst map right now for sure but it has overtaken Ver uh, inferno and that to me is just so clear Here's the thing, I can do the abstract discussion of the map, but I'll just start here, which is one thing I'll never fuck around with ever in Counter-Strike is, it is at the end of the day about having really great matches. So my problem here is this, I'll just immediately put you on the hot seat. So I can think of one map that was interesting on Vertigo. It was obviously that ridiculous Faze Spirit one, right? Yeah. But that was mainly the context of the Vito and the fact that like, how is Faze even winning with no T-Side? What's going on? And a Spirit Shock, it wasn't that the game was the best one. Aside from that, I would challenge you off the top of your head. You're a caster. You were fucking doing the game, mate. Okay. Tell me a good game on Vertigo recently. Uh, <laughs> that, I mean, that's the one that would come to mind, right? Like, um, it, it wasn't, it was... It was very, almost the least played map at the major, so there weren't a huge amount of games on it. And yeah, it can be one-sided. I, I, I had it loaded in the cannon, which was a spirit phase one. I think that was one of the best Vertigo games we've probably the best best Vertigo game we've seen in CS2. I, I think my counter to that would not be, oh, Vertigo is okay. a really good map. Okay. It's it's overtaken it. And my response would be, name a good Inferno game we've seen in the last six months because okay, you can hold on to that vitality phase game that was sort of good. It had a couple of good rounds, but it was still like a 13A, 13-7 or something. It wasn't that entertaining. So yeah, you know, maybe maybe I don't want to die on the hill of like Vertigo is the best, okay. but I certainly don't think Inferno okay. now... Inferno's been solved. I don't think Vertigo's okay. been solved. I actually think it's changed... There's, there's two points on this. I think it's changed a lot in CS2 with the way the audio works. Um from top to bottom, you, you definitely get less audio as CT, so it allows Cs to rotate and and seesaw better. But also, in there, were, there was a recent update where their spawns were changed, mostly for T-sides, and on both those maps, they changed. On T-side Inferno, you're in a semicircle, you're pushed forward further. I thought that would change everything. I thought that would make Banana way easier to take. I thought you'd get more control. It still hasn't changed anything because of the insta-smokes you can throw, whereas if you look at Vertigo, though the, that tiny change where T-spawns are moved forward has, has me meant CTs can't take B-stairs control anywhere near as easily. In fact, you kind of have to concede a ramp if you're getting five-man rush, if, if people are playing their front spawns to get up gap. I think the map has changed, and the map can change if Valve want to change it. I don't think you can change Inferno without completely redesigning the entire map. Okay, I've got some prop comedy for you here, because here's the thing, you want to swim with that tired old cliched current of uh, Inferno's bad? See, that's a school. I'm going to take you to school. That's a school okay. of fish, you see there? See there? Yeah. School of fish. <laughs> because here's the thing, here's the thing. I'm cold-blooded. Like How many animals do you have on your desk? Don't you worry about that. So here's the thing. I've got fucking one right now, and I'm going to take him out the cage, mate. So here's the thing. You've just given a case. It was the only one off the top of the dome. You literally get paid to cast. This is your life. Like, you either don't remember your own life, or you've deleted the Vertigo games, because we all did, and Valve should delete the map. Now, here's the sure. problem. The game you just put forwards as the best possible, like, fucking example was the two best teams in the world who are also the two worst teams on Vertigo. So what you're saying is if people don't know how to play Vertigo, then you get back a game, right? So, okay, I think you've basically just, like, disqualified yourself there. Then I'll go to Inferno and you're like, no, 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 don't use Vitality. What? The best Inferno team in the world who pick it all? I think I will use Infer Vitality, actually, because they had two great games. They were in the game against fucking Cloud9. That was a back and forth game. It was very exciting. Could have been won by both teams. They're also, another great factor, by the way, you guys didn't mention is, it's a map where you can fuck around without a star orper and potentially still win. Get to that in a second. Then you had the Vitality phase game. Might look like a, a whitewash, you go. I don't know if you were doing that game. Probably waiting for the fire 
final, right? That was actually a very back and forth game. You watch the first half of those rounds, you couldn't tell who was going to win. Apex is making calls, but does he hit the shot? Did they get the entries? Phase, it's always like running down the clock, the tension when they go on that A site. The reason why I will always love Inferno, I don't claim it's the best map anymore. I actually, if you want to talk construction wise, I do think maybe, like, for example, you should like open some of the uh, choke points up a little bit. I think you're essentially you're using the old utility at this point in time. You probably need to consider what the smokes and the mollies are like now. It's probably the worst map for utility ruining the round. So if you open certain things up or you close off sets, you don't have to close the whole skybox off. You can, if people don't know, the skybox can even just be blocked with like things there. You could just take certain areas. Like, for example, you don't want them to smoke arch, presumably, or you don't want someone to re-smoke banana from here or something. You can do that. You can take that out. But here's the reason why I'll always love Vertigo. I just hinted at it before. It's actually the reasons you guys don't like it. You guys want 3Ks. Piss off there, mate. There's loads of maps. Go and watch Nuke. You have 3Ks all day long. What's brilliant about Inferno to me is this. On T side, it is the ultimate push and pull map. You don't know which site they're committing onto. So do you sit in the sites and turtle? You might think so if you're a noob. No, you have to make information plays. You have to gamble with like a two-man peak onto the banana. There's no one there for you, right? They're not there. Quick, rotate over. You have to... One of the most exciting things when you're watching a game as a fan is watching that rotator of CT on the map. Seeing when he's going. Does he gamble early? Does he go from a call does he hold by the way I thought it was gangster as fuck that actually when I think it was when uh, G2 and Navi were playing sometimes like G2 would just hold on CT side I think Hooksy couldn't get the read he was just like fuck it let's just stay in the sites then whatever they're doing cart throws off I, think, I love the fact you can go between the two sites it's a classic Zeus style from Navi if people remember back in the day so for me it's an in-game leaders playground because as we're talking about here what do you need to get into the sites utility and trade fragging you don't just go ha ha Zero go kill and then he just goes and wrecks like three people that doesn't happen on this map mate so I, even though look i will argue like back in the day it was one of the best it was that was because people didn't use utility the same way also i think people actually didn't have coaches you played a lot more freestyle back then it's the reason why like the french and the swedes were the kings of cs if you don't know guys they, they liked a little bit of the looser style of play and just played off skill i think in the modern day it's gotten worse and i certainly think the economy is ruining it but the problem with that is mate you let me fix the economy and you'll immediately see like 20 percent more actual gun rounds on that map whereas on the vertigo one you said, like, again, you're just throwing out the hot takes at the end there, just as a fucking freebie. All I'll say is this, when you go, you could improve that, let me know fucking how, mate, because how, you know that that map was around in 2019. We've had, like, three plus years of that shit, and has it ever gotten good? I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for it to get good. And the maddest thing is, I point this out all the time now, and everyone ignores this point. The maddest thing about Vertigo, and this is a fucking banger, nobody uses the ladder. Nobody uses the ladder in the middle of the map. It's almost never fucking used. You just go B or you go A. That's it. Like, that, that is supposed to... You can tell that was designed to be like a super cool sort of like fucking flank angle. Like, you can go down in a nuke and come up behind them. It's a, no one ever uses it. That's how stupid the map is. It really is just fucking bomb site hold simulator. And the joke is that's why that fucking phase versus spirit game was a bagger. Because it was just bomb site hold simulator against people who don't have strats or, or utility. And so it was just who can shoot each other in the head it was actually quite exciting but it wasn't that thing because of the map at least because those teams don't play the map so come on then you obviously, obviously i've got to you have listen no, you, no, you, no. you dared to bring vertigo in so i had to bring it but i had to put the shit back in score what's the rebuttal i respect come on. it i respect me, it Look, I, i'm i'm not gonna argue with the the first point you made which is like oh inferno takes a like okay sure the the idea that oh multi kills whatever inferno takes a lot of uh, brain power sure. to use like yeah there's no surprises i also would say the vp may be a, a, one of the the best teams in the world on that map okay sure. or, you know it takes it takes a fucking crash at 11 11 in the open to beat vp on that map so um i, I yeah i'm not Shots gonna argue with the brain power. <laughs> i'm not gonna i'm not gonna argue with the history of the All map good. but i also just looked up you said you know name a good vertigo go game on. and, and so like, then you looked it up this one so, i just on. looked up like the last like few months of go vertigo on. there's not been any good fucking games there's not been two top five teams playing okay. it and it is one of the lowest played maps right now there's no debate about that like it, 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 oh, it, 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 it deal here's my deal for you hugo right yeah you know what a, a good deal is about two parties compromising getting something they want but giving the other okay. person so here's what we'll do we can take inferno and vertigo and they can both go out as long as cash and train come back in how about that I, I'm I'm not I love that by the way I'm uh, oh, you know, interesting those are the right? two maps I would remove in an instant I want train back in I think it would be perfect in the game right now with the meta we have uh, I'd like to hear your argument for cash though because I do feel like Matt Mario was it you with the tweet about cash being similar to ancient I actually yeah, like that yeah. take. I think I think they I think they play very similar but also yeah. I think it's like not very tactically deep which you know it isn't necessarily a bad thing you can definitely have like a a puggy map kind of in the pool but 
I'm I'm not sure how it would fit into into the meta today. I'm not I'm not okay. anti cash. I'll make that compromise with you. Bring back trains. Yeah, I think that's, that's a fair deal. As we get rid of both. All I'll say is yeah. this: whenever anyone says that as well, like, where's the tactics? Or mate, overpasses all the tactics in the world, but then fucking breadhead Nico's like, I don't like this map. It's like yeah, because bro, you're the IGL or fucking Hooks is the IGL dickhead. Like actually, you know, you know those guys, Alexi B and Carrigan, they've both won majors after playing with you. Let's check your majors. Zero. Oh, bloody hell. Maybe tactics are good. I don't know, okay, coach. Crazy idea. Maybe everything in the world can't be solved shooting someone in the head with an AK. I could make a straight fire geographical joke there. But, no, I I will, don't. but I will leave it for now because I've, I wouldn't say I've learned my lesson. I just sort of, I hold back the fire until it's my platform and there's other people not here. That's the other thing. That's the other thing I did learn is like, I, one thing in my career I do feel bad for, not even entirely the situation, but I just feel bad when people like Smix just got like caught in the drive by essentially. Like that's, I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying to do that on my own foreign thoughts now. Right, let's go on to the next one. So Maui's is going to be something. So why, why is your bad point, Maui? Well, this is uh, just, I feel like I've brought this point up before, but it's just that we have to see yet another example of it screwing over a team that seemed to have some potential, which is that Pain are not going to be seemingly able to play with Nissa moving forward. And that's just, it just seems to be another product of the fact that Brazilian loans, Brazilian buyouts are just so ridiculous in that scene that if you're trying to get somebody over from one team to another, you're going to have to play, pay a king's ransom just to move them. And I just feel like the bigger point throughout all of this is that, well, one, it's bad. I've talked, to, we've talked about the fact that these buyouts are just, they're just ruining the Brazilian scene in general because you can't put together the best 10 players across two rosters. It's like they're all split up on like, four different rosters. There's like MIBR, there's Pain, there's Furia, uh, there's Imperial. And it's just that you could, you probably would want two top tier teams, which I think could probably compete in the top 15 at the very bare, at the bare minimum. And another thing is that I, one guy's journey in particular isn't even Nissim, who is the guy that I brought up that isn't, they're gonna not going to be able to have. It's Big Azera. It's that this guy with this roster was able to get them into the top 15. They're ranked 14th right now on HLTV. And for me, Big Uzera is a top 10 in-game leader in the world, and for him to now have to suffer the consequences of being, what, what is this curse, being Brazilian, he's basically just hamstrung on the players that he can play with, he's handicapped because now they're having to bring in uh, another, like an academy level player, I'm pretty sure, and it's just like, what is this team even playing for? They have to just keep playing through some more uh, South American qualifiers. The only thing that they're going to have moving forward is that they are going to play that get get event in Rio, which is kind of against. Uh, there's a couple international teams, but it's mostly Brazilians there too. And I just I'm just getting so frustrated by the fact that this is just this is just reality for for Brazil and for South American CS that we just have to keep seeing the best players constantly pulled away from each other even though they were right next to each other they were literally playing on the same team and then pain and sharps couldn't come to an agreement over the buyout of nissan <clears throat> yeah that sucks i feel like even though the the america's run that we had in the rmr and then you know thus the major going even deeper i feel like on one hand we have brazilian teams and players playing at the highest level we've seen in, in a long time but at the same time we have the whole scene in flux like there are there are south american teams and a lot of them in advance just completely dodging their their advanced matches because the the payoff isn't there which is super weird like if you go on hltv you see all these 101010 defaults because oh. south american brazilian teams aren't even bothering with advanced anymore which is a nice. super weird like time if you consider the linear progression that yeah, at least the, the pro league the, yeah yeah the the, the advanced uh, and the, the pro league is given uh players especially you know from that region like looking at 9z and and, and pain and teams like this so it's really weird that we have so many because how on one hand you could probably make two top i don't know maybe not top 10 but top 15 teams in the world with the brazilian talent we have but furia have clearly proven that they don't want to be a top team in the world in fact they were the least impressive brazilian team at the major despite having the you know the best brazilian player in the last five years and and for big Uzera, going back to him i think it'd be great to see him like the guy speaks english come to europe you know have a chance but I, he's also an older guy i think someone said he had had kids that that's an incentive to stay at home as well not up and leave at this point in your career so it's a really weird time i think i i when you say he's a top 10 in-game leader do you mean his calling maui or do you mean the level the individual level he brings into this team on top of having to in-game lead 
it's uh the latter i i made a i made like a big rubric for what i consider an in-game leader and it's like half of it's calling but then there's a few other aspects to it too and part of it is your performance on the server and that's what boosts big zero no doubt sure yeah one of the problems you have in this topic is like i won't bore people because i've made this point many many times before but unfortunately this this like weird thing that's a relic from brazilian football soccer basically where what used to happen way back in the day was they got paid so little for so long and it's still nowhere near now as far as i know compared to like the european clubs that essentially brazilian soccer just became a feeder league for europe and in fact it was the ultimate feeder league because you know how fucking good brazilian the national team is and you'd see some player from the brazilian league in the national team you'd see him at a world cup and you'd go why are we going to sign this guy for the Premier? Just go get that fucking guy. He costs pennies. And so what they did, unfortunately, is they implemented a whole thing where essentially like, they would make massive buyouts for people. So even if you scouted him and he was going to be like the equivalent of like a Ronaldo, you have to actually fucking pay like, the top dollars. So that was a way to make it so like, at least you get recompensated if you're the team in Brazil that loses this guy who doesn't get to play for your team. I feel like that doesn't even make sense in the modern day in Counter-Strike. That, that angle doesn't work because the funny thing is this. That maybe worked in if you'd have done it at the time when like you actually had all the brazilian talents who could go to international teams but first of all brazilian players don't play on international teams and at the moment the only people you're hurting is the top brazilian orgs because even though some of them have millions i'll tell you one thing right now this is why i'm not going to take some blame off them right now the problem is the unproven player oh, you can't pay 500k for an unproven player it's just suicide to do that or oh, you better have like you better actually have played or you better have like Snappy or someone telling me like, no, no, this guy's money. Like, I promise you, sign this guy. Unless he, if you're just going off like some hype and like, you know, he played a qualifier or he beat you in like a local thing, you can't pay 500k for that. And the problem is this. It's not that they don't have money. I'll also put another side to this, which is because you want the proven thing, they just keep recycling the Luminosity and fucking Immortals lineups. They just keep recycling them. All they do is they go, right, well, listen, I've got 700k, so instead of going with the 700k and buying Skulls and just putting them in a Brazilian team and giving them a chance to win, you sign Fallen. Because it's Fallen. Like, hey, bro, all the history and the hype, and he's going to bring all this stuff to the team. But it's like, you see, like, all I have to say is this. I'd love to do a, one of these, like, experiments. I sometimes do it on late-night shows, but I'd like to do it for real. I'd like to do a lie detector test on both the GM and the star players of Furia. And the first question is, will you win a major with Fallen? I'd like to see how they'd pass on that one. I think that fucking line it'd be insane, mate. Like, I don't believe anyone really believes in going. What you do there is, look, he's a known quantity, though. You figure, like, the floor is going to be pretty decent. And, you know, he's going to bring some fans. It's going to be a cool story. Fuck all that noise. Because the worst thing was this major actually made this point a hundred times more significant. Because the joke of the major was this. If you're Brazilian and you're watching, good news. There is loads of talent in Brazil. That's why everyone not called Furia was low-key actually like a fucking upset threat against almost all European teams they played. Your problem is that should signal the greatest golden era of Brazilian couch strike ever. If you've got like two, three teams at the bottom end that can do something... And then you've got Fury, and they're good. You'd be amazed, but Fury isn't good. Like, Fury is barely better than those teams. And yet, when you look at the names on the Fury roster, because the others aren't proven, except for, like, now they're starting to do it at majors, you look at it, on, on paper, that should never be the case. Even today, you go look at that Fury roster, and you just think, like, that has to be top 10. How could it ever be, like, you know, 20th or something? Like, but you see, like, they just haven't got it done. And I do think that's both bottlenecked it, and you're just wasting your time, because here's the problem. In Europe right now, I can tell you, Forrest wants to play in a team. Nobody wants to sign him. Even though he's Forrest pro. Now, are you telling me Fallen's more legendary than Forrest? Like, if I had to pick, actually, I think Forrest could pop heads better than Fallen does right now. And Fallen, remember, the maddest thing is, doesn't even IGL. You know, that went away really early on, guys. Like, that one angle was the one reason I actually said it wasn't a bad signing. Maybe he just IGLs, it frees Art up, and then the rest of them frag out. That could even work. So I think right now the whole Brazilian scene is a mess. This is a very good one at the bottom end, but it's also reflected at the top end. And so I think even the money that is there isn't being spent very well anyway. Like, the obvious example is when Skull's got that, that massive buyout for pain, well, what have you done with it? Where did that go? Just in the mourner's pocket or something like, man, as far as I can tell, you just got like another player that's like an opening and just bring him in. Like, and now what? He has to just become the next Skulls, like an next promising player that's going to be good. So yeah, I think it's a sad state of affairs all around because I actually do think there is a lot of talent. I did like a super team video at the end of last year where I tried to look who were all the eligible names. Man, I had like 40 names. I will say they did lack IGLs though. That was the main problem. That was the one position that was bottlenecking the whole thing. That's why actually I think Maui's right to ride the biggest era train. If there's one guy comes along, he actually has like some decent results. You look at the players, he has some very good results related to that. And then also he can frag himself. 
What are we waiting for, mate? Can't we just have this guy in Fury? What, what, what are we waiting for at this point in time, you know? It's definitely too late for Fury, but I do feel like we have, like, the 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 so many upcoming Brazilian players. That's, like, the one positive I'll take away. Like, not just Nissim, uh, you know, the, the legacy guys, Dumao and Lato, like, are sick. Obviously, we've seen them in, in the in Godsend in the major already. I think it was Stockholm. Um, and Imperial impressed me more than I expected oh, as well. Like, No Way yeah. and Decenti, like, those guys are sick. No Way hasn't even played pro for six months. He was, like, a streamer or a content creator. That guy was playing insanely good CS on LAN against, you know, top 15, top 20 EU teams. So, it is first international outing so yeah i think uh i think you have good talent at least it just comes down to the management of rosters and these insane buyouts which i don't know if that'll ever go to be honest i think that's gonna lock so many players in contract jail including big Zero, who i'm sure we'll see back at the next major with a completely new lineup right for my bad point i have framed this very very carefully i actually think despite the fact they were in the major final this is actually fuck Boston. This is the cruelest loss of Carrigan's entire career because of the context that it was in. So first of all, he just won two normal grand finals to get to the final. He beat Team Spirit with a genius veto. They just straight up beat Vitality, by the way. That wasn't even because of the veto. They just actually played them heads up and just beat them in a back and forth game where it wasn't like it was just super. And then you get to the final, right? The Navi team that gets there is one of the weakest opponents you'll have faced in the whole tournament at that point in time, but they're not really that good a team. They even don't even have that good a veto. Like, they're not really supposed to win. And think of the context for Carrigan. If you win that major, right, first of all, that whole, like, how greatest in-game leaders of all time. We're not doing CSGO anymore. It's not CSGO, right? But greatest of all time in all versions of CS. Mate, if you win a CSGO major and then the first CS2 major, that's already a fucking spicy one. I've always said, if you do Glaive against Carrigan, because the four Glaive ones were with, like, basically six players. If you do Carrigan and you go and you have like two different um, fucking majors with international losses, that's actually a different kettle of fish. You can't compare those directly. They're not one-to-one. -one. So I would actually say, since no one would have done two at national major wins, that in its own way could make your goat case. So unironically, winning that final, which in theory was as easy as playoff game, might have actually granted him goat status in some people's minds, but he blew it. And not only did he blow it, he blew it after the second map was a 13-2. Like everything inside the universe said, you're about to win the major right now, mate. In fact, you've done the hard work. Just fucking, it's, it's, all you have to do is call a simple, Inferno game, are you going to win? And not only did they lose, and there were some really outrageous things, like, if you're a FaZe Clan, you're just like, where the fuck was this big guy the whole tournament? He wasn't even in the server the whole tournament, so he just waits till the last map, and then goes, right, time to play, and there's fucking balls out like old school Robert Ori or something in the fourth quarter. This is mental. And then also, I'll just throw this in there, you not only fail when you're the favourite and hyped to the heavens, individually you go like what one and 15 or something mental like that like you actually also have for real a nightmare map that might be the worst in your actual career in context and remember if you just watch eye tests in those other two series in the playoffs he was fragging he was actually for real guys winning duels against Spinx and Zewu, and he was going against fucking like Shiro and fragging this guy as an opener when he has the AWP like these things don't happen so I feel like it's like it built up into the cruelest possible letdown at the last minute for Carrigan because crucially he is in the Nico category he doesn't give a fuck about finals and semi-finals they don't even touch the side mate it has to be the trophy or nothing if you're these guys which I love I love that they're in that pressure to be great but I'll tell you what it means when you lose like this no amount of people at a bar afterwards like yeah great game man what about that spirit who gives a shit mate we lost who gives a shit you just don't care at that point in time you know yeah and with all the conversation around veto as well like i you know i don't think the series came down to the veto like you said winning mirage and that kind of dominant dominant sense and then going in and disappearing on inferno which is the worst map in the pool i think there's also an argument on that veto <laughs> well for, could maybe spare him some blame then yeah you know, it was the worst map anyway so what can you do yeah exactly that's why uh they, they didn't pick nuke they went for the ancient pick which i, I think was really yes. scary we saw how how good uh navi looked on ancient in the semi-final against g2 uh like i think i think that was kind of a weird veto and it actually had more consequence in any other veto in the tournament you know you could argue that gt1's there but like to to go into ancient super risky sure losing it super close jl doing what what he did the day before but that one hurts especially when you again like we were hopping this in the cast like that was the third final in a row in the royal arena for carrigan and he's he's come second place every single time uh to, to different teams so that one really hurts and this uh, one was a real tournament not a banana cup <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, the the still available for work, by the way, Blast. You know, if you want if you want to uh, upgrade for Banana Cop, get the real fucking deal. You know, keep going. Uh, yeah, the visa, the visa was the worst thing for me. Like not picking into Nuke. I don't know. Maybe they felt like they uh, had been like Navi had prepped for them as well. I think was it Blade who said after it was nice to be underdogs for once. It was nice to be like underestimated. And I think probably everyone did that for Navi uh, in in the playoffs as well. I don't think you know it was it was not an expected win. So I'm I'm sure there was a level of underestimation for phase in that game and of course yes bit did something he hadn't done all tournament and is now the only winner of cs2 and csgo major so love that for him not really sure if this one hurts more than boston uh if that's the original take here that that it's just the fashion in which they lost Boston, I mean, both were pretty bad, obviously. Like, they, losing to a comeback from Cloud9 where you're 15-11 up on map three is a very different situation to lose in where you're the favorites. All you need to do, you've put yourself in a winning situation. You need to close this out. You have the best players in the server versus, well, I, you still have the best players in the server, admittedly, when you play this one also versus Navi, but you were never in map three at all. So it's, it's just too drastically different tragedies for Kerrigan to experience in his career because when he was going for the Boston one he's trying to build the case that he's a great in-game leader he didn't really have as deep of a trophy cabinet by any means as he has today whereas now it's not about trying to enter your name into the conversation of best best in-game leaders it's now trying to really build the case that you have any goat chance above glaive because that's the one guy that's standing above him right now and he still does he still does if you're talking about all counter strike i, I couldn't i couldn't i couldn't put kerrigan's name above glaive in my own list right now i will say that i guess like the constellation prize here is that you're well kerrigan you're actually the goat uh you're the goat of cs2 in game leading obviously it's like eight months but like that that's still something you can hold oh, on to good. but yeah i i that's I don't think he's. I don't think he's smiling about that one. He, he doesn't think. I don't think he thinks of his career in like CS two eight month intervals. So, I, yeah. In terms of how this one went down, I also just looked it up. In terms of individual performance, it's the lowest rating he ever had on a single map in a major period. Uh, group stage, playoffs, whatever. And uh, it's the only time he ever had one kill in a game. He never had zero. He never had uh, two. Even he never had one. Never had two. The lowest he kill count he had before with this was three. So obviously, worst individual performance. Just got blown completely out of the sir. And uh, nothing, nothing really to show for it, despite the fact that hey, it's another finals. But like, no one cares about that other than people that are still like trying to get their name in this. Yeah, and, and FaZe and CS2 have been in every Tier 1 LAN final as well, but they've only won it twice, right? Two, two out of, like, eight or two out of seven. Uh, to, yeah, Sydney and CAC, yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of, sure, you're the you're the GOAT of in-game leading, but you're also, you know, second place pretty much every time. So that, that hurts. I think what, as well what hurts for me most on that, not most, but in addition on that loss is, like, Rops has been one of the best CS2 players individually, mechanically, at majors, in especially in, in CS2, majors aside. This was his, like, lowest rated major ever. And that's with the, you know, MR12 rating stat buff that, you know, seems to be inflating ratings anyway for for good for decent performances to great ratings and he he was completely missing he was missing in that game sure carrying a one kill but that was again on the t side of inferno if you actually look at the rounds like he's just running in first and just getting traded anyway but it did feel like they knew they'd lost after like six seven rounds that's what it felt like to me two quick things one the reason it's the cruelest maui is because as you say when you win one major it's just like right okay cool it's like, like to be no one could see your shit all the people who, I mean, idiots still say, well, you know, no one could say your shit IGL there, but spoiler, no one's ever going to put Alexi B in like greatest IGLs of all time for one major. The difference between this one, like I say, is you would have been the goat to some people. If The problem if people don't know in sports is, I, it's like a thing that I always hate in Counter-Strike. We did it all last year. Remember the two ones where G2 had that streak coming into kind of eights here, and then after that, fucking Vitality had that win streak. You remember these win streaks, guys? When the win streaks happen, people quickly, when it gets to like 13, 14, 15, they go and look up what the record is right and when they see the record they go oh my god they're gonna break it in two seasons like history tells you they won't history tells you they that's the reason no other team ever broke that win streak because actually it's insanely hard to do that many wins in a row so the problem here is this as well i can even build off that point each said the fact he made every final mate that's not going to continue forever 
And also, how many chances do you get to be the GOAT? Like, we don't actually know if he'll ever be in another major final. Yeah, right now it looks great. Yeah, he's a very good team. They're obviously so consistent. The team's excellent. You have no clue. For all you know, I'll give you an example. Eventually, rain's going to drop off. Maybe you yourself are even going to get worse. There's all sorts of things can happen in Counter-Strike. So I think there's a world where absolutely this, this might end up being the one where Here's the thing now. He's not thinking about Boston now, Maui, because it's done and he's won another major. He's been there and he could have won it. The problem is when you're in that rocking chair and then that guy goes, all those fucking kids who didn't even watch the games are doing that shit like they do now when they look up stats and someone goes, oh, I always thought Carrigan was the goal. They'll go like, bro, he like fucking lost two major finals and had one close win. How could he be the GOAT? And that'll be it. That'll be the end of the conversation. If you're Carrigan, that's like one tear, like, fuck. Because the worst thing is you have like, you know it could have been, you know it could have happened. In fact, I'll even say I think that's worse in a way. At least Cloud9 actually had a very good run. They beat some really good teams to get there. And they did also play some great CS. I thought, like, because you're such a big favourite, to get completely smashed on the third, you're never even in that game. You never were. Even when you won a couple of rounds, it was more like, right, OK, we'll wait and see. Maybe they're going to start getting good. No one ever believed they were going to win after that. It's like the more, that's probably the worst way to get crushed, I think, personally. OK, let's go on then. So now we're on to the bad points. What is your bad point, ugly. Hugo? Oh, ugly. ugly, ugly, sorry, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of on brand with what we we're just talking about uh, in the recent major playoffs, but it's it's Zai Wu. It's Zai Wu in major playoffs. And you mentioned Cloud9, which Vitality beat. That is actually Zai Wu's best win in a major playoff in history. The highest ranked team he's ever beaten in the it playoffs is. of yes. a major is Cloud9. And this was, yeah, yeah sure, Cl I'm, I'm with you. Cloud9 made, had a great run. They beat good teams. But this is not a championship winning team. This is not a super sure. team Cloud9. This is a wounded Cloud9. And it was the highest ranked team and best team even on paper that Zai was ever beaten. So when you compare, you know, the, the farming of Blast finals that Zai was done, the 18 MVPs, the three-time number one player, and, and then, you know, his legacy is is what in major? Sure, they won Paris, but how how fortunate were Vitality that not only did FaZe fall in the quarterfinal, but then Heroic also lost to Gamer Legion in the, in the semi and completely choked it. Maui remembers that one well, but like at the end of the day, sure, he has a major win, but only at the weakest major playoff of all time and even then he barely got the mvp we almost had second place ema yeah. get the mvp it was very close Real. in statistics so if, if you look at zaiwu the, the argument we make for nico is like oh he's the king without the crown he has all these trophies he has all these runs he's individually not in cs2 but in csgo one of if not the best rifler ever and now, you know, what, what does that mean in your legacy when you retire if you don't have majors? Sure, Zaiwu has the caveat of a major, but if we look at him individually in playoffs, he has been weak consistently when Vitality have even gotten to the playoffs. And, you know, if you consider the form they've had coming into some of these majors, it's kind of disappointing for a player of his caliber. For me, I mean, this is not too controversial of a take, but Zaiwu is absolutely not the best AWPer in CS2. He ended CSGO as the best AWPer, the best player. Monacy is clearly the best AWPer in CS2. It's not even close. The way that he takes control of rounds, the way that he uh, makes moves on CT sides. We're seeing Zai Wu static-like device in 2018, but he doesn't have the supporting team around him always. Sure, Flames had a great tournament, but I, Zai Wu... Where, where is he when it matters in majors? What will his legacy be? I think a lot of that is getting put to question, and now it's happened in CS2 again. Wow, I guess Spicy. you're ready to get. Okay. Spicy. Yeah, I guess you're ready to get flamed like by it. the like uh, entire it. country of France because uh, we've been. I've been here before. I mean, this is uh, this is the, the Zaiwu that we saw at this event. Obviously, they brought up the fact that he was sick before in the group stage, but then they confirmed on. It was kind of a weird confirmation on social media. They just said he's back or he's here, and then Apex said that he's feeling all right. But in the pregame stuff, and so you don't ever really know. But the thing is that the history books won't always have that asterisk next to the fact that these these games took place, that he was here for them. Because also the thing is like we don't know if some of the players that performed outperformed him were feeling sick or anything like that. Like some people, you know, it's the selective information that we have about his performance versus the fact that we don't know any excuses for so many other players at this event. Um, I, I and you end up having to like you end up kind of forgetting these kinds of things and losing a lot of context. But just to bring it back to Zaiwu's whole career, 
uh, he's still incredibly young. Uh, he's still in his young 20s. He still has a, a near spotless resume in terms of his last four or five years of professional play. He's still still one of the top five players in the world for me. But when it comes to big pressure moments, at this point, yeah, we've seen him have some pretty difficult moments for himself. I think the biggest thing that's hurting me in terms of just like the micro aspect of this, not even talking about the narrative side of things, is that you're, you're totally spot on with the fact that he's not one of the top offers in the game right now. He's one of the top riflers. He's one of the top hybrids in the game. But when it comes to opping, yeah, I think Yanko's tweet was so great and it was so incendiary that if Monacy is the best opper right now, and Donk's the best rifler. What is Zai Wu right now? And you might say that... Best French player. The... Yeah, 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 exactly. So best French player. <laughs> Not wrong. So, yeah, so... I mean, it's only so Apex I... competing with him, but... <laughs> right, hey, that's practically it. That's practically it. I I, 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 I think that Zai Wu can still go... I mean, Zai Wu's still going to go down for me as one of the top players right now, but I think this is why this is why it was so frustrating and why I think so, a lot of people were like, why do you hate Zai Wu so much? And I think the only thing that I, I feel like at the beginning that Thor and I were doing was that we were just not crowning him before it all happened. We were not always willing to give him the, that like goat title because everybody just throws it around. It almost means nothing nowadays, especially on Twitter. It means absolutely nothing. I'll even say it jokingly sometimes now because I've gotten the brain rot from that website. But in terms of like talk shows, in terms of desk segments, he's not a goat. Uh, he's not the goat. Uh, he's, he's not there yet there's still so much more that he would have to achieve to catch up to even simple right now and so for for Zaiwu, sick but if he's not sick and he's still putting up these kinds of numbers in a playoff where is this is this the drop off are we starting to see that now is that is that is it a downward trend or is he going to bounce right back like it never even happened the problem here with the whole like was he ill was he wasn't aside from the stupid thing that they would say publicly that he's better i don't even know why you would ever do that like you actually in theory want to use that excuse potentially in fact you even want to probably make the other team think he's sick so they get like false confidence and then when he comes in the game and smashes them they're like oh shit guess not. like that would even be more i don't know why they even thought to do that it was such a fucking pr fail in my opinion if that was just his social media team you fucking idiots but when who, what do you care you got you know the fucking five-year contract your 20% cut, didn't you? So who gives a fuck, right? Don't need to win a major. You've got your money, mate. Fucking dickhead. So then you have the whole thing, what Maui says. Don't ever get distracted by why do you hate him, right? You do understand that's a literal non sequitur piece of cognitive dissonance. If I said to you, you know why I think LeBron James is overrated? Because actually when he was in a lot of those playoff games, even though he scored a lot of points, he actually fe fell apart in the fourth quarters many times. And in fact, in the clutch, sometimes he did give up the shot and to someone who wasn't even that good. And that's why he did it with... If you then go... I'm going to ignore all that. Why do you hate him, though? It's like, that's not even, you're not even talking about the same topic I am. Like, you know the obvious way I could spin that back on you? You just watch someone bomb out. Suppose he's the best player. Some people are telling us he's the best player of all time, by the way. They're not even just saying best in the world, which he isn't, that he's the best player of all time. If you're going to tell me he's the best player of all time, and then he fails, here's my question. Why do you love him? You just love failures. I don't get it, mate. I love watching great Counter-Strike. If he plays great Counter-Strike, Zeebo was one of our favourites to play. When he's in these playoffs, he's had a lot where he bombed. Now, I will say, if you go look at his whole major resume, he had a couple where the team was scuffed and he did frag out and they didn't win. There's only a couple, though. It's, it's actually almost like coin flip, if you ever look. It's more like, one, he does all right, but doesn't have a good team. Next one, he's a good one. Nah, he doesn't do that well. The problem is, though, it doesn't work for all of them. Like, you go look at these ones. Like, Berlin, that's his second major. He loses to fucking Avanga. Are you ready? With a Dren. That was in 2019, by the way, guys. Adren was good in 2017, and at that point, he's probably already 28 years old. And I even bring Maui up on this. Don't ever make that excuse that he's very young. He's not even vaguely young. Are you ready for, like, an actual context drop that'll blow your mind? Do you know how long a, a 1.6 career Get Right had? He was at the top for, like, three years, maybe. He was in all the majors, right? Get Right is, like, was something like, he'd be, like, something like six or nine months older than Zebu when he won his major in CSGO in 2014 like 23 is not young especially it's what it's, it's young if you came in the game at 21 bro he came in when he was 17 he's had loads of majors he had loads of years yeah he got a couple stolen by the COVID year he still had a lot of lad majors though people people don't realize how many it is at this point the worst thing is because they're in denial they just keep ignoring that like the pattern keeps playing out it keeps playing out keeps playing out and here's the other thing remember the old excuse ah but zero just has no help right bro when he was at the fucking Rio one where they didn't even make the playoffs he had the same exact lineup that won the fucking uh, Blast Paris major. He had Spinks. Even his bombs were Dupree and Magus. 
That's a pretty good lineup right there, mate. I'll tell you what, if you want to talk shit on Nico, Nico's made it further with worse lineups, in my opinion, including at this major now. And by the way, you know that whole thing, because that's the problem. Because Zebu has won the major. Well, now it's the, now he can never be called the playoff choker. Of course he fucking can. As he said, he won against the weakest teams ever. And by the way, he was trying to choke those games. He spent the first two-thirds of all those playoff series being chilling. Other people kept them in the game, like Magus and like Spinks. And then he would come alive at the end because they kept his ass alive in the game. They didn't let the game end. And then he would do some magic shit with the AWP and he would win out. And you know what? Guess what, bro? What, you beat Immer in a grand final on a, like a fucking close game when like... <laughs> He's never even been in that scenario before, you fucking moron. That one's the weakest run of all time. Meanwhile, you look at some of those other rosters. Like, think about... If you want to say Nico's the king without a crowd, I tell you what, if you want to stack up wins against ranked opponents, Nico has a fucking gang, mate. You haven't had one of this tournament. He beat fucking Mouse. He almost beat Narvi, the team that won the fucking major. He's had loads of majors where he's gone and won a series and played well. Also, not just win, play well while doing it as well. He's fragged out, mate. He's had some fucking banger series. Like, I'll tell you right now, that one series he had at Stockholm in the semifinals against Heroic, who, by the way, was like a top three team in the world at the time, that fucking puts most of what Zero's done in the major playoff to shame, mate. That was a legendary performance. That was like one guy with a rifle at that, by the way, just putting the whole team on his back. Like, you know what? Fuck it. They are better than us. They're even calling better than us, but we're going to the finals. That's what we're waiting for. So what I would say is this. I've always said the same thing, but they always play the fucking bait and switch. It's actually called the Mott and Bailey strategy. What they do is this. Zemo is the goat. He's better than everyone, and he's the best player every day of the year. Then the big, then the major comes, and we go. But he isn't the best player. And in fact, he sometimes isn't the best player on his team. And they go, "All right, fucking ch chill out. He's he's young, and th not everyone else was awesome. And besides, like he has one of it. Like, oh fuck off, mate. You're trying to make a goat case. You're saying he's the best in the world. Like I'm. If you put that standard, that's what I have to argue against, don't I? If you want to say is Zero really good, I'll put him in that Nico category. Even if he doesn't win another major, he was an incredibly good player. In his case, he had some problems under pressure potentially. By the way, I also think you're not doing Zero favors. Literally. I would already have said this to people like Apex, my mate, if I'd have thought it actually could, would do any good. I know they have sports psychologists and stuff. You can't just... One thing they do now, which drives me crazy about sports psychologists, is they think it's like a fucking mentat out of Dune. It's like, I have a mentat here. He will calculate, what well, this is what's wrong with you. No, different... It's like a therapist. Not every therapist is going to work for every person. You're going to have to find the one that works for you. Maybe that guy does a great job with Spinks and Apex. Maybe he doesn't vibe with Zewu. Maybe Zewu, by the way, I'll give you a random one. Maybe he needs some, like, French veteran. Maybe someone could come in who's helped him. Maybe Kenny S comes and helps him with what he did. And the, I don't know what the angle is, but I would actually take this. Since his game game is so good, like Nico's. This is the last piece, and it isn't about the game. It's something in the head, mate. And so I want to see... This is what the idiots don't get, is this, Maui. They think my dream is that he fails every major. I just want him to actually play like the GOAT if he's that good. Just fucking show me, mate. I'll sit there every major with the popcorn. And yeah, beating into the breach, that don't do it for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> that ain't it. Yeah. <laughs> on, on that quickly as well, yeah, the, the the hate thing, it's not even about hate, it's about an expectation, it's about like wanting to see uh, someone who's supposedly supposedly going to fit in the moniker of GOAT or best player in the world, like, if you're actually going to do that, you've got to not only do that consistently, and I don't just mean winning blast events and making playoff runs, I mean like winning trophies and dominating while you do, if you want to make a comparison with Zaiwu and Simple, like, look at Simple in those positions, he will win a game on his own, like, when was the last time you, well, never have you seen Zaiwu in the playoffs of a major, taking control going i want this and and winning the game for his team i feel like that's you know and yeah again the team around him right now is actually kind of sick so flames he had a great tournament and zyro was third best rated on the team so ill or not disappointing uh given his accolades and given his skill and I'll just throw this in there. Fuck majors. Where's your prestige events? Where's your Colonna kind of eats here? What am I waiting for? It's not even a major, mate. Like, listen, we could talk all the shit on Nico. He's got two of them motherfuckers now. That's quite an interesting discussion, even if you compare the actual mm. resumes against each other. Yeah. I think it's wild. Go on, Maui. What do you think? For my ugly point? Oh, you already gave your take, I guess, right? I'll tell you one last yeah, thing, though. Yeah. I'll mention one last thing. The reason why the why do you hate him or love him point is so stupid. Oh, yeah. It's because what you're revealing, which is totally legitimate, is you aren't a fan of Counter-Strike. You aren't even an analyst. What you're doing is you love Zemo, who's your favorite player. That's fine. I'm not saying he shouldn't be your favorite player because that's the weird thing they do. This is the thing I'll never understand about fans. If my favorite player fails... They expect me to, like, apologize for him being my favorite player and say he's bad. Like, I'm never going to do that. Like, he's my favorite player. Like, you might think someone's better. By the way, be a fan of Zewu all you want. What I'll never understand is this. This is a really weird thing about young men. Why do I need to think he's the best?
Why, do, why is there a piece of the puzzle in your soul doesn't feel complete until an old British boomer says Zemo is the best? Because spoilers, you know the maddest thing of all? He can make me say that. He, it's up to him. You know, he has the mouse in his hand, right? I'm not in the server. I can't just fly in and be like, get down, Nico, and like block the bullet so Zemo fucking doesn't get the kill. Like, Zemo can make me look like an idiot any moment he wants, but so far he hasn't done it, so fucking roll on. And if, and actually, I'll tell you right now, I actually do believe if players like that don't go and get help, it's actually one of the reasons I actually used to body bag device every time he failed, because I've talked to him behind the scenes. I've told this story before. He just was in denial. He didn't believe it was a thing choking. He thought he just had a bad game here and there. And, oh, you don't know, I was going through something there. Oh, that was a girlfriend. It's like, it's every time with you, mate. So what I decided was this. You know what? I know how I can actually get you to change. I'm going to put that... F I'm going to go... Since you're on the hot seat, I'm going to go and turn the fucking gas up. I'm going to go... Let's go up to eight and nine. Let's get, let's get fucking hot on this one. Because I tell you what, at that point in time, you're going to have to change something. You, uh, if you don't, and the fucking the whole narrative is going to go against you. So I actually, I'm glad to see who has all this pressure because I wanted to see him actually come through. I wanted to see him win finally and do it like as the actual stud against the best teams too. I want to see him beat Face Clan and just smash him and go to the final. And you know what? Everyone's going, that's Don and that, and they just fucking murk she raw. He's winning every duel against Donk with an AK. He beats both of them with their guns and then it goes at the end. You know what? This is for me, Thurin. I mean, the, the, the narcissism that he mentioned me in his major winning speech, well, you know. <laughs> to be fair, JL almost did. He thought about it, mate. You could tell he thought. You could tell it was going like, shoo, uh, fuck all the haters. And then he thought about going, and fuck that too. But then he remembered that my dick was the main way he was able to look at <laughs> So at the end of the day, partial credit to me. Right, okay, yeah, we'll go to the, the ugly point for Maui now. Okay, so this is... This is based off of the talking counter thing. We already re referred to it earlier, but it's uh, the fact that there's likely to be a dissolving of the regional RMRs because, and I think that I, I put this as ugly, not just because it's entirely bad, because we've actually already talked about how there's there's benefits to the circuit that maybe we don't have to worry about RMRs, that they're kind of going to go seemingly a more DPC type of model for this uh, entire thing. But uh, I look back at, I, I just think of like the flaws in not having the RMR or having a ranking system. Like I'm, I'm just kind of unsure right now if, if, the R, if it's just you flatten the scene and you put everybody on the same scale, uh, there's a couple teams that just wouldn't have made it to this event that otherwise would normally through the RMRs, which end up usually having some, some pretty good stories. So I looked at the Valve rankings based off of their point system, which I think is still, they're pro it's probably still like lightly a work in progress for them, but everybody's kind of seen that it's basically the more prize money you win, the more, the more points you get. And so I, I, went through the rankings and everything like that. And before the major, the teams that would have made it at the bottom, actually, we would have actually gotten a handful of teams that didn't qualify. Uh, naming naming them starting Falcons, with Astralis. I assume. Huh? I'm guessing Falcons as well, right? Yeah, Falcons would have made it to the major. Uh, some other teams include Astralis, Monty, Big, Betboom, Nine Pandas technically made it, but then they kind of didn't, MIBR, and Liquid. And I feel like... If we get those kinds of teams into this, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to debate right now whether or not I think those teams should have made it over teams like, say, Koi or Amcall or Linvision or Legacy or, or Saw for that matter. But the main thing is that I, I, just, I just feel like if they haven't revealed all the details yet, it's all just a point from Talking Counter, obviously. But if they're just flattening it out completely and they're not doing regional rankings, then you are going to miss asian teams there's just less events for them to play unless unless we just start having these huge chinese tournaments which are just domestic competitions because i just think that right now still the valve rankings are incredibly flawed because it is based off of prize money earnings and like bet boom practically just pumped up their own money into their team because they have bet boom events that bet boom gets to go to like i feel like that's just it's just such a flawed methodology and it's going to lead to some really wonky stuff where the RMR isn't a perfect fix because you don't necessarily want just a single tournament's results to speak for what just occurred in an entire season leading up to a major and its qualification. But it's still not a perfect system by any means. And if they are flattening it out, because I just, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe Valve is still going to have some kind of uh, a regional ranking within that. But when... When Chad and Jason and Yanko talked about it, nobody talked about the fact that 
In South America, there's less events with less money. In North America, there's less events with less money. In Asia, there's less events with less money. And everybody needs to just now move to Europe. And I felt, felt like this is kind of what the RMRs were able to rise above, which is the fact that you don't need to play in Europe. You can just be the te best teams in your regions, go through the open close qualifier RMR itself to make it to the major because that's really that I kind of and that's kind of the beauty of the major system is that in the essence of it, it is the biggest and most open qualifier that we have in the Counter-Strike space with the most inclusion of teams from different regions, which as it stands, from what I heard from like what they were saying, that if we just have to play Star Ladder, uh, Blast, ESL, PGL events, it's not really about these qualifiers as much so. Stop me if I'm wrong, but I, I, aren't you operating there under the assumption that there won't be spots per region so you're talking about like oh south american or asian teams have less prize money so they aren't as high on that global ranking but wouldn't there be so, still an amount of spots essentially per i'm guessing so, he they would have means... to move to europe no no, I think, no, no I think what he means is if in your region you're ranked like number one like if tyler yeah. was or something or lynn vision then they'll get like a spot like to the major yeah i'll guess it's like slots you know still. the, the top yes. three in asia get ranking yes, points but well complexity got more slots than anybody else in na because they're playing more european events than any north american team sure. so you have to go to europe to get more points basically okay. what i'm saying is that if yeah. you have a majority roster from a region like you're like say say for example a team that wouldn't have made it would have been greyhound greyhound didn't make it through the rmr they didn't have they would have been the third most points going into the major if greyhound just did a boot camp in europe by virtue of them playing more cct west events or random like dreamhack events that are in Europe but aren't in Australia, well, now they're just leaving their scene behind because they know the best way to get Valve ranking points is by playing in Europe where there's bigger prize pools more consistently. They have more opportunities to get points. No, that's a, that's a very fair point. I think w uh, what I hope is that I'll, I'll, I'll go so I'll circle back but you mentioned the bet boom thing and uh, and you know inviting your own team and then pumping them full of prize money presumably when we get round to when things are flattened out in 25 26 we'll get to a point where valve are only going to give the blessing and, and say like oh yeah you can get these ranking points off of these events but you can't be inviting your own team you have to be inviting based on number one you send the invite number two in the world you send the invite number and you go through and see who accepts right so that that will those events will give you Val ranking points. So immediately you remove the idea of like, if you want to run an event and invite your own team, you're, that's not going to get Valve's blessing and it's not going to affect anything. So so that goes and then going full, full circle, hopefully with all these increased amount of events, PGL starting to run a load over the next two years, we're going to get more events in different regions. I, it's sort of coping, like CS is, is definitely an EU-centric esport, and I see how that can be a problem, but I hope that it's negated by more events outside of Europe, which in general is a cool thing anyway. It'd be nice to go and, and, and go to see new cities and get new crowds and, and you know expose ourselves to different you know locations for events. I think that's cool. So... I see. I see why that is would be a problem in the short term, but I'd like to think long term that that would get fixed out with not only the the value of prize money on events, which Valve did decrease by the way, they didn't announce, but they did decrease. It's in the the rule book um, recently. Uh, but from what I understand from speaking to them at the major, like it's it's not done yet. They're not there. They they still need to fiddle with it, and they still need to find that perfect formula. And and yeah, sure, maybe if we have no RMR for the first major of, of 2025, it may be a bit scuffed, but I am optimistic in the long run it will be better. I think RMRs are the worst thing to ever happen to the major since that fucking randomizer for the third map in a best of threes. I think they're absolute ass. I mean, the stupidest thing about them is this thing I'll never understand. So if complexity does well, then your region gets more spots, even though they're not complex. What? What is, what's going on here? Like, what the fuck? By, by that logic, by the way, you should essentially, if you want to actually make NACS better, you should just import two Europeans to all the top teams, get more placings at the major and get more slots. What are you doing at that point in time? Because here's the problem. Basically, Maui's angle veers into like a League of Legends thing of like, it's the United Colors of Benetton. I want China to have a scene and South America. I don't give a fuck about their scenes. I just care about the best teams at the major. And you know what? When Lin Vision goes, I get sad. Because you know what? You might go, Falcons didn't sit. Falcons would murk Lin 
envision a best of three. Are you even fucking kidding me right now? That wouldn't even be close. Even you know what? Even Team Liquid could probably go head to head with them. I'd like to see a match like that. In fact, why can't I see a match like that? Why can't I see that in a massive qualifier? What I used to love about the old system was you went from minors, but that didn't get you the major. That got you to the major qualifier, and at the major qualifier, it was a free for all. And do you know what? Sometimes Vega Squadron made it, and sometimes Space Soldiers made it. And I would never have picked these teams, but they earned it. My problem in the RMR system is you technically earn it, but I'm sorry, you actually didn't earn it, Saw. Like, what you did is you went to one tournament that anyone cares about, and in some BO1s and a BO3, you got through against some good teams, right? The reason why I think some of the other teams should have been there is what they did on the rest of the circuit. Like, what's the rest of the circuit for? Do I love about systems like tennis, uh, fucking, obviously, like the classic ones were all quake and stuff back in the day? It's actually your play on the circuit that's going to get you there. That's what makes you go to the next match. So I, would, I want the rest of the circuit to mean something. The obvious problem is this. If the rankings are as whack as they've been for so long, or they have some weird angle like prize money, and then suddenly, you know, like the Saudis or the Chinese do a tournament for like 700k, like a WSG garbage thing, it will pump a certain team up and there'll be loopholes you can get around it with. That would be a shame because I think the team that will actually suffer there, obviously, is the team that's good enough to qualify to every tier one land, but they come like ninth to 13th. And then what will happen is one of the teams that's their rivals doesn't qualify to one of those lands, but goes to a smaller land, wins the smaller land against worse teams, gets some prize money and they get more points. Like That incentive structure feels a bit off, but you can tweak that. You can tweak that. This way, I actually do feel like as long as the rankings aren't whack, you can't have that shit in the past where the number one team of the world can fail. They can't. They'll be, they'll be at the major 100%. You can't have a top 10 team probably fail to go. And then on the last thing of like, it's unfair for the region, but that's just the nature of the game right now. And right now, being as there isn't unlimited money, Europe is where there is a very, 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 very healthy Counter-Strike scene right now. By the way, don't worry, the Middle East is going to have fucking tons of events soon too. But in Europe, right, that's the spot. So yes, if you aren't a team that can get an org that can get you to that place, you just don't get to play. And by the way, finally, what I would do is I would make one last change if I were them. I would still allow pure meritocracy, but I'd only do it for like two slots. So here's where, if you got offended early and you're sore, don't worry, mate. I'll have one a last chance qualifier for a bunch of teams from the regions who aren't going to the major. And if you're sore and you go to that and you beat Imperial and you beat Linvision and you beat Liquid or something like that, you can have the spot at that point in time. I'm cool with it, mate. Maybe, you, maybe we should have a team that can do a miracle run. I just don't want it to be like, theoretically, half the teams can be miracle teams. And, and these ones where, like, like the Guild Eagles of the world, it's like, mate, if you were actually good, I'm sorry, the major isn't what would prove it. It's the rest of the year. The rest of the year is where you'd have gone to lands and you'd have, like, you'd have snuck into a top eight at a Karavitsi. Then you'd have gone to a clone. You wouldn't have made the playoffs, but you know what? You actually beat, like, fucking Ents in a series that time. Like, hey, we're fucking around here. No, all you did is make some majors, upset some people, never even do anything yourself. Never even make the playoffs, ever. So you never even had some glorious run. Like, at least the Turtle Fire made the playoffs, mate. They were, and by the way, they were even in that match. They could have made semis. That wasn't impossible. At least they're doing something. Like, that team earned their way there for me. And it's earned their spot at the major. So I just don't like this thing where it feels like RMRs are like a lottery ticket. And you have some little fucking Charlie fucker like, I got the golden tickets. Like, fuck the golden tickets. How good actually are you at the game? That's what should get you to the tournament, in my opinion. Right. One last one. I've left it till the end. It's a little bit spicy. I'm just going to say it. No one else wants to. And you know what? I'm the biggest Lexi stan of all time, right? So I'd never say, shut the fuck up, dickhead. I called out Device when they fell off. I've told Simple to shut the fuck up, kid, when he's wiling out of control. I've told Nico many times. He was like, I will do an interview with Aaron when he deserves it. It's like, bitch, let me know if you deserve to do an interview with me. I'll, maybe I'm just waiting at the end of my career. Everyone will go, you did interviews with all the great players. Why no Nico? Just a bit of a wanker, one each. As a fundamental human being, couldn't fuck with him. So that, that's the way that goes. So what I'll say is this. I think Navi just won a fluke major. This was a complete fluke. I had them going all the way to the final. And even then, it was tenuous. They won them. I thought they were going to play Mouse in the semis. I thought it was tenuous. They beat them. I was just sort of thinking, you know, in the best scenario, and Mouse might have, like, choking issues. I didn't know it would be this bad as in the quarters. You know, maybe one player drops off. Then you have, like, a great call from like I thought I was even, like, it was going to be a close thing for me at that point in time. So if you look at it, not only did they win the lowest percentage of rounds in the whole tournament ever of a team to win the major, they had such hard work. If you guys don't know, they had to play 18 maps to get to this title. They were fucking barely getting through. This is a team that can't 2-0 people. 
Like, even when they 2-0 down in Total Fire, by the way, that easily could have been a 2-1. Like, one of those maps, I think the Mirage one was wide open. Like, they, Total Fire almost got there even. So, this is a team that cannot 2-0 pick. The joke is they didn't even, in their best moment ever, which is winning the grand final of the major, they got 13-2 on their own map pick, for fuck's sake. And by the way, in that grand final, you know the one we don't talk about because he hard carried all the rest of the tournament? Wonderful didn't even play well in that final, mate. He was just fucking chilling. He was missing off. He was actually whiffing his shots when he saw him. Like, what the fuck? He never whiffs. He whiffs. He never whiffs. He's always the guy who lands like the fucking normal shot. It's like the it's the no scope maybe he won't hit after it's the monetary no scope. So I think that's outrageous. And then lastly, I'll just give you another angle that's just just shows like this we're not that insane. Think about how mon mental it is that JL dropped that crazy rating for the major. It was bonkers, wasn't it? It was insane. Like that actual number, yes, I agree with you. CS2 and MR12, it's boosted the stats a bit. So it's not like an MR15 game, but like, I don't think people get it. Those numbers are like prime cold zero numbers for fuck's sake. Like, that's like best player in the world numbers. You had the best player in the world in this logic of this tournament, or one of them, and if you ever looked, Na'Vi was the lowest rated of all the playoff teams. And in fact, if you add in all teams, they're below VP. Now, they played more maps, but that's also because they make a dog's dinner of it half the time. Like, this team didn't even frag. Do you want to know a fun fact? They won the major, and they averaged more deaths than kills. And the team collectively ended with more deaths than kills overall. I don't think that's even possible. That's mental. That's why, by the way, that's why for me, I get to win on the Alexi B angle because it's like, who the fuck else do you think was doing this? Like, what do you think, mate? That's like you're finding every edge and you're grinding out the finest of margins and you're having to like make some hero call here. You have to, oh, mate, it, this was the hardest work I've ever seen to win a major, even though, ironically, the third map was actually a runaway. Yeah, I think this was almost the playoff of chokes, right? Like we had so many you know, maps and series the the where where we had expectations, they just yes. disappeared, right? Like Spirit go from 3 0 in phase to sure they got shocked by the veto, but also they pulled a huge comeback in that game. Like yes. that, that was about to be a, a stomp for phase. They pulled it all the way back to overtime, then they lost it. Uh, the Mouse game, sure, Mouse have had an incredible few months, put them on a stage. There were I, I, there were definitely extenuating circumstances in the second half of the second map of that game. Oh, of course, yes. They were getting they were getting bodied, right? Like were. maybe there was a world they could make a comeback. Like you, there will always be an asterisk on that match, but they were getting bodied in the first three halves of that series. So that was that was Miles choking on the stage to a G2 that in reality you can make the case shouldn't have even been there, that whole VP situation. Uh I you know I won't look at Cloud9 and say they choked. I'd say the fact they're even there is is impressive enough. But uh even in that even in that you mentioned J, uh, JL even in that G2 Navi game uh, like he he won that game. It, it, you know, you talk about rating. Even in impact, he won that game on ancient in round four. He won that game on that round. Like he 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 aces on an eco at B ramp, pushing down. They went on a seven round streak. You could tell G two was just completely broken. They got blown out uh, of that of that first half. So yeah, JL played sick, but it did feel like the the playoff of chokes, or at least playoffs of like completely. You know, so many top teams, but but against the narrative, against expectation, were, were pretty much every game in that in that playoff. I'm trying to I'm trying to even see. I, I was looking trying to see like by rating alone, was any major MVP ever even lower than JL's numbers? And I don't think I don't think there is one actually. I'm no I'm still sure, work surely he's I, uh, not surely Jim was like lower than that, wasn't he? No, he wasn't. Not not rating. Not oh, rating. Right, rating. Rating, rating, rating Jim all the, everybody's higher and I'm I'm all the way back to twenty seventeen right now. I'm just like just flying through this. I mean, okay, for the for this for this event, I mean so the what okay wait wait a second what what, what was exactly the like point here okay no, Kirby's the first major. one that's yeah okay so the fluke major thing I feel like what what this team has is just like it's obviously not personnel in terms of firepower I said I mean I can't believe I had I said this in front of Hooksy at the World Finals when JL and Navi beat them there and I said that the G two lost this because of the calling. Because you look at the teams face to face, and obviously G2 has more firepower, and that's when Hooksy did that little face at me or whatever. And I just said, "You do, you do have more firepower." And I feel like it's foolish to think that going into it, it it almost like wraps this whole <laughs> discussion up. Because the, my first point was that, well, just look at the longevity. I mean, you had a great coach, you had a great in-game leader with this, but you actually look at the 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 people and the roster on paper, and it's not really that strong. Like, JL, by the way, JL at that Paris Major had under a 1.00 rating. Like, it was almost kind of a miracle that Blade even decided to take him. And many people, including myself when he took him, were just thinking, I mean, he was a good piece in Apex. He seemed like a good team player, definitely knew how to play in a structured system, which Apex was running at the time, which they aren't now, by the way. They're running a horrible system. But 
it was yeah this feels very much like a miracle run that i i feel like can kind of kind of just get people needlessly hopeful for the future of this navi team if they go on to win some kind of grand slam with this five-man lineup i don't even know what to say like I, the amount of improvement from individuals across the board to give them that level of consistency is is just unprecedented uh because because despite Despite what Maniac said on the desk in the pregame of the major, I mean, Wonderful's not a superstar. He's not a superstar. Uh, he, right now, he's like barely a star. Uh, JL is definitely not a superstar. Um, Alexi B has got the best case for being an all-star and elite level player at his role right now. But then you look at Bit, just kind of like random pop-offs here and there. It just happened to be that he decided to pop off in map three of the most important map of his life. But then for um, beyond that, Ema, oh my God, like... I, I feel like the real where the takes really need to go for me very soon is how long does Ema last on this roster? Because God, by the way, it doesn't that say something right there? The guy just won a major, but it's a le totally legitimate conversation. Should he even be in the team anymore? Yeah, because <laughs> that's I'm still, real. Like, like I'm legit. I've, I've, I'm, I'm doubling down. I'm doubling down. I just still, I still think with with Simple, this is still a, an incredible team. May it's probably even better in the long term. I, I'm, I'm glad that it worked out for Ima in this in this case. I feel like it's it's crazy that he was contesting with Zaiwu for major MVP of the last one, and now it's like you're just contesting to not bottom frag with Alexi B for your team in a major winning run. That was that's a wild wild uh, run for him. So, but I I don't I don't see how if he's gonna play this level of CS that they're gonna keep winning anything. I, I just don't think you could have two people with like that's why this this run does read as fluke because you shouldn't be able to win a major with two people rated beneath 0.9 your best being a 1.2 something and you win a whole tournament like it just like it's it's i don't know when this ever happens it just doesn't happen you, you just basically need to have the best teamwork of all time and, and even though all these players have had high peaks and like can perform it, it it's like the the inconsistency you talk about bit like having random pop-off maps in every series in the playoffs a different player hard carried navi right like not navi uh, yeah navi sorry wonderful in the quarter uh, jail in the semi bit in the final and sure jail performed in the final no doubt but it's it's not consistent and well consistency is key that's the opposite of a fluke right so i guess only time will tell if we can see a navi actually keep it up but uh if you, you if you're looking at consistency this team doesn't have it in individual performances so will they have it in runs i doubt it i have one more one more thing that i mean maybe maybe it could spin this the positive about navi moving forward is that they actually might be one of the it's hard to contest with phase right now because they're making the final the grand finals of every single event they play but i just see navi right now being a team if they keep this core of having an incredibly high floor like they kept actually doing very well with this five-man lineup and the, obviously they are predicated based off of preparation calling mid-rounding all and teamwork but in terms of it, it kind of it's actually if they don't play the same style as the heroic of last year but they actually have that same quality to them where i'm not really looking at them for a superstar i'm looking at them for just the teamwork and whatever blades cooking in the lab by the way the reason that maniac take is so egregious is because here's the thing just because maniac's so lovely even though i do call a lot of people dickhead funny i never would call him a dickhead and do a chad thing like maui snake did this but i will just okay i like it. chad by the way let me let me make the air get the air clear here like i like chad a lot like we talk about stuff out off camera and we've hung out in his we've hung out in his room pause my pause what would what, 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 what <laughs> the punchline be why would you need to add the pause there <laughs> no, okay. You want to fuck around like that, mate? It's all good. Right, what I'll say is this. The, the ways of Maniacs Wally with that one is, mate, you also had the take that, like, Simple may as well not even come back because just basically Zee was running the show for me. He's getting world number one. By the way, that's contested right now. He's going to win all the tournaments, all the accolades, everything. By the end of his career, he's going to have everything. Mate, when's he going to start? I just said before, he's won one weak-ass major, zero prestige lands. He's had a billion chances now. Right, Simple isn't even playing, by the way. <laughs> and also, spoiler, Simple and fucking Monacy and uh, I guess Donk would have been. They weren't even on your side of the bracket, mate. Like, what are you waiting for at this point in time? Like, if you're that great, do it. So, Maniac, mate, I'd worry about your GOAT first before you start assigning, like, status to other people, like Superstar. Because to me, Superstar is, like, top five player in the world, mate. It's not just, like, a, a top, like, best player on your team. Because if you have, like, 50 Superstars, then how are you a Superstar? A Superstar is he's super among stars, Wonderful's a star, and he's maybe borderline. But all I'll say is, when you watch him, you even played against him, you watch him play against Monacy, there's a difference there. There's a step up that you take in what Monacy can do that Wonderful can't do. And then the last thing is, on the Hooksy one, shout out to Hooksy one time. Here's why. He's one of the people that actually made me think, because I hadn't thought about it for years. Maybe I would like to do an event again. 
Because I saw him go and try and do that little face at Maui. And I saw him do that side eye fucking meme at Kassad. And it's like, you know what? Same thought I had the second I saw that hedger clip. Just put this motherfucker with me on a desk. Put him next to me. One, I guarantee he won't do that. And two, if he does, I have a brain that is faster than anyone for coming up with the fucking bants. So just try it, homie. Shaq tried it. I actually took his, I blocked his shot, went back over him and dunked it on his fucking head and we'll play a one-on-one. So if you want to be Shaq, Huxy, you want to be a big man, well, I'll tell you what, I'm Kobe, motherfucker. And I get more of them rings. Okay, right, that's the end of the episode.